Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. We have a new microphone set up here. So we're going to uh, bear with us as we uh, work out the kinks. Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, it sounds pretty loud to me up here. Okay, so welcome um, to the board meeting for June 22nd, 2022 for Pajaro Valley Unified School District. I'm Kim DeSerpa and I welcome you tonight. If you need translation services, um, we do have translation over here. So make sure you see that nice lady. She'll give you a translation kit. We're gonna start out tonight with the Pledge of Allegiance and Trustee uh, Acosta, will you lead us tonight? Thank you. Uh, next up is item 3.3, um, our superintendent comments from Dr. Michelle Rodriguez. Yeah, thanks so much. So we are so very fortunate that we have an ever-expanding career technical education program. Um, one of the things that Julie Edwards has been able to do is in a recent partnership is work with our local airport. And so what you're gonna be seeing in a couple of minutes is a video which was taken of our fourth grade students. So we had about 500 of our fourth grade students that was able to go to to the Watsonville Airport. Um, you'll see some things going on on there, but they were able to um, see planes and helicopters taking, um, taking off and landing. They were able to go inside um, cockpits, um, talk to our aviation staff, and learn about ways in which they can, when they're older, um, be part of the aviation career. And so I want to be able to show you this is a Mesty Bradley Minty White Calabasas Freedom and Radcliffe students. And so here they are. Alpha, right here. We appreciate the opportunity to partner with the school district, so we thought let's reach out to the kids. And so what about field trips? When I was a kid, I remember going to the airport and grabbing the fence and looking at the planes and putting together model aircraft. And who here knows who Neil Armstrong is? What did he do? First person on the moon? First person on the moon. Neil Armstrong learned to fly in an airport like this. So as these kids come out here, what they're seeing is the medical portion. They're going to see what it's like to par pack parachutes. They're also going to look at the science of flying, lift, weight, drag, etc. So there's a lot of opportunity for kids to come and try to determine what a future could, for them could be in aviation. And I want to reach however many students we can um, early on. That way they know that you know flying for them and maybe in the future becoming you know a pilot, even you know going to Mars is an opportunity here and getting them out of the classroom and having them experience something new is great to be able to ask questions and just experiencing um, the landing and departure of some of our um, aircraft here is also um, great. Thank you. That's very inspirational. Next up, we have governing board comments, item 3.4. We'll start at this end of the table with Trustee Holm. Thank you. So I attended our uh, Paro Valley Education Foundation meeting, and it's so good to see our foundation grow and develop. I also attended the um, Esperanza del Valle performance last week, and that we are so fortunate with our partners in the arts, and you know their dancing was a gift to the community, and it was just a joy to, to see. So that's it for me. Trustee Soto. Yeah, I yield my comments this evening, thank you. Thank you. Trustee Roscoe. 
um, got the opportunity to attend the Pajaro Education Foundation meeting as well. We're uh, getting ready for our 5K race, which will be taking place October 30th. Uh, so more information to come on that. Uh, and thank you for being here tonight. Trustee Costa. Thank you. Um, I just want to extend a happy belated Father's Day to all the fathers of our PBUSD community Thank and you. beyond, um, <laughs> including and also not limited to our two own very trustees, Trustee Soto and Trustee Dodge Jr. Um, and as well, I just want to wish everyone beyond tonight. It'll be about a month before we see each other, so um, enjoy your summer. Um, and I just hope you have a very enjoyable and safe summer. Thank you. Trustee Judge Jr. Thank you very much. Um, I just wanted to briefly say the name Mas Hashimoto, who recently passed. He was a veteran, a soldier, a longtime PBUSD teacher, a union leader, a historian, a human rights advocate, a defender of civil rights, a leader of the Japanese American Citizens League, somebody who taught me that children don't belong in cages, no human being is illegal, and he was a once of a legend. So I wanted to say thank you, Moss, for teaching us history a lot of us didn't know about. You, know, you, you taught us about how Japanese Americans were, were taken away during World War II, but they still came back and defended our country. And so I just wanted to say thank you for all the history lessons that you taught me and the city of Watsonville. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I myself attended the Pajaro Valley Health Trust um, event, which honored um, Catherine Rockwood, a longtime um, RN and lactation consultant at Watsonville Hospital, and um, also honored our colleagues over at the Community Action Board. I think, I can't remember the name of the group. I think it's like Proyecto or something like that. But they are doing wonderful things in the community to advance health um, for vulnerable populations. And then, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on who else was honored. I'll come up with it later. Oh, Gina, how can I forget? She gets honored at everywhere. Gina Castaneda, our wonderful colleague and um, probation officer who um, formed and founded the Aztecas um, soccer programs. So thank you, Gina, for all the work that you do in the community to help vulnerable children. Um, I've also attended two um, PVPSA, Pajaro Valley Prevention and Student Assistance meetings. We are actively getting ready to search for a new executive director with the loss of Erica Padilla Chavez. Um, we won't try to replace her because she's pretty irreplaceable, but we thank her for the years of service that she gave to PBPSA, um, bringing it from a $2 million organization to a $7 million organization, providing mental health services for kids and families in the community. So we're actively um, starting the process of looking for a new executive director, and I am on the subcommittee helping to find the right person. So um, with that, if there's anyone out in the community tonight who would like to make a public comment, make sure you get your yellow card in the back of the room um, addressed and signed and over to Ava before your agenda item comes up. And we'll be happy to um, have you come and speak at the podium. So with that, we'll move on to item 4.1, approval of an agenda. Um, I'd like to move to approve the agenda with one change. I'd like to move item 9.6 uh, before 9.1 to accommodate our presenters. And before we vote, we do have a speaker to this oh, item. Okay, oh, great. Okay. Thank you. Chris Webb. I am just going to be my. Press the button. Oh, okay, thank you. I'm uh, just wondering if we might make one other change that would be to move item 9.13 to follow 9.4. If not, I understand. Thank you. Chris, I think we're going to leave it the way it is. Oops, sorry. Thank you. 
I think we're gonna, yeah, I think we'll leave the leave the um, SELPA plan till after the budget because I think the budget helps to, and the LCAP plan helps to inform no, that. 9.13 renaissance mural. Oh, I'm so sorry. The way to the bottom. I thought it was 9.3. 9.13 to after 9.4. I'm okay with that, yeah. yeah. Do you want to amend your motion, Jen? I'll amend it to okay. reflect that. Okay, first, and do we have a second? I'll second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstaining? Okay, great, thank you. Uh, next, we'll have the approval of the minutes from June 8th, 2022. Looking for a motion? I move to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Item 6.1, public comments. Do we have any speakers? We do. We have three speakers to this item. So we're going to start with John Sims, followed by Laura Saddle and Chris Webb. And I'm going to give you an extra 20 seconds, okay? Hi, Mr. Sims. Good evening to the Board of Trustees, President De Serpa, and Dr. Rodriguez. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you tonight. My name is John Sims, and I'm a teacher at Aptos Junior High School. When teachers and other site staff are asked to participate on an interview panel, current practice of PVUSD is to ask these stakeholders to volunteer as a member. This means teachers and other site staff are not compensated while assisting PVUSD to hire new staff. I believe this practice should be revisited to recognize the value and the time commitment that teachers and other site staff make to this hiring process. By extending an invitation to volunteer, PVUSD demonstrates that teachers and other site staff add value to the hiring process. This value deserves just compensation. By asking for volunteers, I believe PVUSD takes advantage of the teachers and other site staff that, want, that simply want the best outcome uh, for their school community. Furthermore, district administrators participating in the hiring process are not asked to volunteer. To my knowledge, interviews are scheduled during the regular work calendar set for the administrator participating in the interview process. Yet, the current practice is still to ask teachers and other site staff to volunteer during their unpaid vacation time. In my opinion, compensating the administrative members of an interview panel while simultaneously asking that others volunteer does not demonstrate PVUSD, PVUSD's respect for the time of everyone involved in the hiring process. Teachers and other site staff deserve to be treated with respect. This means that they are compensated for the value added to and the time they commit to the hiring process. I'm here tonight to encourage the board to ask administrative staff to review this practice so a more equitable solution is available to all stakeholders with an interest in participating. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Is uh, Laura Saddle here? Hi, we're becoming old friends. It's so good to see you again. Um, okay, so I'm here to address the possibility of the intervention teachers being temporarily moved to other sites for next year if we don't have enough new hires for, to fill the vacancies. I totally understand why that came up. I do, it's an option. However, the irony of that is that you are all getting ready to approve the LCAP plan, which involves you know, intervention teachers in a very integral way to support our students in learning early literacy foundational skills at the elementary level. And I also read ahead in the agenda that Mr. Klappenbach is going to be discussing and talking about the block grant, $2 million block grant to help support our students in early literacy. That involves intervention teachers working tightly and collaboratively with the other teachers at those school sites. So I know you understand the irony that it would be 
to pull existing reading intervention teachers or regular intervention teachers from other sites to go fill vacancies. Our students have all been below, most of them have been below literacy, They've, they've been below everything for years. Um, a lot of them have. And everything that we've done the last five years, six years, to bring those scores up to get those kids more literate is working. The MTSS plants, the intervention teachers, more classified staff. We don't just do reading intervention. We don't just implement SIPs. We support teachers in learning SIPs. We provide coaching for classified staff who is learning SIPs. Um, we also have been part of the rotating sub list. We go and sub when teachers don't show up. Thank you. Anyway, just think about Jenga. Think about all those little interlocking pieces. You pull too many of those out and everything goes to heck. Thank you. Thank I you. Would Um, at the, the last meeting, um, Nellie's, Nellie's comments really uh, resonated with me. Um, after the school year that I had, and, and this last year was harder than it should have been, and it wasn't because of COVID or learning loss or the students, but just um, the way that policies were changed and they weren't communicated and, and the way like stakeholders didn't seem to be as involved anymore. And I think this led to some dysfunction. And it's, it's, I think it's a factor in why some, some teachers may not return. Um, but I, I wanted to echo Nellie's call for anti-bias training. I know she was talking mostly to ECE, but I, I would say you know, it's something to consider at the, the secondary level as well. And um, another, another thing that I think might help too would be uh, if we're gonna have um, a, a restorative justice push, then let's have a coordinator and let's be like really serious about um, doing that and, and institutionalizing practices. And then on the non-fiscal cost front, some things that we might do would be going into negotiations, think about with our contract, how can we ensure that um, sites are clearly communicating policies and that those policies are consistently enforced. I think if we do these things, we can not only uh, mitigate some of the teacher retention issue, but then we could also um, increase student achievement. So it's so something to think about. Thank you. Thank you. Are those all the speakers tonight? Um, yes. Okay. Um, next up we have employee organization comments and we're starting tonight with 7.1 PBFT, Pajaro Valley Federation of Teachers. Good evening, board, Dr. Rodriguez and President De Serpa. My name is Mindy Dumont. I don't, I don't mean to interrupt you. It's going to beep right now. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> and I don't want to. Thank really you so loud. much. So I'll be timing you on my phone. Okay. So we can't adjust it to five minutes. Okay. Um, so we're ready. Thank you. My name is Mindy Dumont. I'm here to represent the PVFT. I'm the VP of membership and a fourth grade teacher at Ohlone Elementary. I've been a teacher in PVUSD for 21 years and this past year was by far the most challenging year ever. It was wonderful returning to in-person learning. Being back in the classroom was so beneficial for our students, social, emotional, and physical health, and of course, their increased learning. But it was difficult and frustrating to not have enough substitute teachers and to constantly lose prep time. It's strenuous to meet our students' needs and be able to communicate with families when our workday is pushed to our limits. One of the challenges we are concerned with is the continued lack of instructional aids, DIS service personnel, and classroom teachers. We especially see a huge need at the secondary level. The PVFT has broached the subject of a retention bonus, but it was a lackluster response. This district commonly experiences a loss of teachers just after they earn tenure, who leave the district for better pay elsewhere. By doing more to offer a retention bonus, you can help solve that issue. 
You'll hear about the need to hire agency personnel to fill the gaps in our SELPA because this district constantly struggles to hire credentialed teachers and DIS service personnel. These personnel who will not build connections with their students who may not be competent enough to fulfill all the duties of the position, such as writing educationally relevant and meaningful IEPs, putting that task on another member to take on, and who can and do quit whenever they please. Although many districts are experiencing a staffing crisis, is that the reason to give up on retaining the professional educators we currently have? Is it a good enough argument to not invest in the people we have right now? The time for making excuses and relying on agency personnel is over. It is time to be proactive, to show teachers that you do care, and to start finding solutions. Education is students plus educators. You can't put students first if you put educators last. Thank you. Thank you, Mindy. And thank you for representing PBFT. Uh, is there anyone here tonight from CSEA, our California School Employees Association? Yes, Richard, oh, good. Richard Martinez. Great. Hi, Richard. Hello, how you doing? Good, thank you. Board of Trustees, Michelle Rodriguez, and the Board of Trustees, our cabinet, my bad. <laughs> I just looked at Clint, he messed me up. <laughs> so, here we are at the end of the year. You know, we worked hard and we do our jobs and we try to represent our district, our community. A lot of my members, a lot of the people in CSCA feel like we don't get respected enough. We don't get the pat on the backs, not that we're looking for it, but just a simple thank you. And the district does not provide that. We have people, administrators, that will walk by a classified employee and not show them any respect. These are the people that open the doors. These are the people that lock the doors at the end of the day. You gotta respect the people that take care of you. They pave the road for you to do your job and make you look good. I get tons of emails constantly whether if they're good or bad, about what goes on in this district, what happens in departments. And I could ramble off about those departments, and I'm not gonna say anybody, I'm not gonna throw anybody, anybody under the car right now, but for the most part, I'm asking the Board of Trustees, Dr. Michelle Rodriguez, to point to your directors and have them reach out to me and talk to me. I need better communication. And I think we got a little lack of that. I do talk to Michelle, I do talk to Allison a lot, but it's everybody else that give direction. And that's where it falls off. There is no respect. We're going into negotiations here soon. Um, I hope it's a good negotiations. And I wanna see where that respect lies. All right, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone here tonight from the Pajaro Valley Association of Managers? Hi, Hello, good evening. Good evening, President DeSerpa, Superintendent Rodriguez, and members of the board. I'm Carol Ortiz, Director of Extended Learning here in PVUSD, um, representing Pavan today. Today we completed day eight of our summer school program. We have over 2,000 students participating in TK to 12th grade in an over at nine sites, and these students have been attending consistently since day one. I did want to thank our site administrators at the summer school programs for being present, for taking care of hiring, for dealing with staff issues, student hiring, student health issues that we had a, an issue happen today, and our site administrator did a wonderful job taking care of that. Um, emergency, daily supervision of multiple programs. We have some schools starting as early as 7.30 for the before school programs and some schools ending as late as 4.30 for the after school programs. So we do have our nine hour programs happening this summer and so far they're very successful. 
I look forward to sharing more details of the summer program at an upcoming B2B. I'd also like to acknowledge all of the interdepartmental planning and collaboration that has occurred behind the scenes this summer in order for us to have very successful programs. This includes collaboration with migrant, transportation, food services, maintenance, HR, payroll, purchasing, SELPA, and I hope I didn't miss anyone. But I really appreciate the collaboration and communication with the district directors in order to make our summer school programs very successful. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. That was a nice positive report. Um, next up is item 8.1, our report and discussion items. And this will be an update from Climatech Infrastructure Modernization and Utility Savings Program. Good evening, President De Serpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Um, I'm here tonight to follow up on a meeting we actually had back in October, October 27th of last year. I know it seems like forever ago now. Um, we actually had an RFP that was finished and completed that Climatech was selected as a uh, partner to do some infrastructure changes. You may all remember that Bradley and Calabasas were the two that we focused on initially, as well as the district office where we have some um, certificate of participations or COPS funding specifically for the district office. So unfortunately, once again, I don't get to do the fun informative presentation. I get to pass it off to Climatech, but I'm happy to pass it off to Climatech and allow them to introduce themselves. Thank you, Clint. Madam President, Superintendent Rodriguez, Board of Trustees, staff, community, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here tonight and share the information that we've been collaborating with staff on uh, over the past many months. And to, you know, we're really looking forward to sharing this comprehensive infrastructure renewal program and helping the district further its sustainability goals, its green initiatives, while addressing some critical infrastructure and saving operational expenses. So just to back up, um, and Clint mentioned this a little bit, there was a competitive RFP solicitation back in the fall of 2021. Um, on October 27, 2021, Climatech was fortunate enough to be selected by the board to be your partner, um, not only for potentially this phase, but also future phases as well. Um, and the, we developed the utility baseline with our engineers, which is the cost that it takes to operate your facilities, looking at engineering a site assessment, so walking the sites as well, and then verifying the scope and funding with staff. So multiple meetings, collaborative in terms of prioritization on that. And tonight we're looking for your feedback and input as well as we progress in this process. Excellent. Well, as was uh, mentioned by Clint, uh, the focus off the bat here is a couple of key priorities for the district. First of all, looking at Calabasas and Bradley Elementary Schools, providing some permanent power resiliency solutions as backup power. And then looking at the district office as well, taking some of those restricted COPs that are only allowed to be used at this facility, addressing one of your highest energy users. In fact, 25% of your utility bill per year is used at this campus itself. Trying to create some general fund relief that can be applied to different programs for students out of those funds restricted to be used here. Um, there's a lot here on this matrix. Uh, the next few slides are gonna kind of break down category by category. If you move, you got that perfect. Um, so first off is building automation systems. So these are the controls, effectively set point schedules within your buildings. At Bradley, we're gonna be continuing on what's already been done by the district and wrapping up that campus. And then really the focus here is at the district office. Um, you've got a 1950s type technology of a pneumatic system here. It's one of the oldest systems we've seen in a long time. So looking at upgrading that, if you go to the next slide here with newer modern technology and controls. So again, remotely accessible. Um, by the team here, operations, diagnosing equipment, and then allowing you to have some different, more energy focused uh, technologies and uh, systems and in, in, in programs in there as well. Uh, here, major upgrades needed to the district offices campus as well. Um, looking at the AC and the heating systems, uh, the chiller, the, the air, uh, cooling tower here, very old systems. Uh, the heating system, the technology is actually relatively newer, but it's running side simultaneously with the cooling, so you're heating and cooling the building at the same time in a lot of spaces. Um, looking at a lot of constant speed equipment as well, it can't be ramped down when there's only partial staff in the building or different programs going on.
on, um, some leaking ductwork on the roof, as well as uh, nearly 200 individual controllers throughout the building that are, again, through that pneumatic system, older equipment. And again, this is a campus that houses uh, about 200 uh, certificated and classified employees, as well as a school site itself. So it's not just administrators here, it's comfort issues for a lot of staff throughout the district. And then looking at some modernized technology here, can be replacing that chiller and cooling tower, can be recommissioning that boiler, looking again in concert with those new control systems, some variable speed pumping and air handling technology, sealing up the ductwork on the roof, uh, and then uh, really providing increased comfort throughout this building and campus. LED lighting is pretty self-explanatory. Those three campuses all have a mixture of different fixtures and different technologies. Going to be standardizing those on LED technology, um, both to help with uh, uh, replacement of equipment, longer lifetimes, and obviously the energy savings. About 3,400 individual fixtures will be upgraded through this program. Um, and then really the focus uh, as well is that backup power solution for Bradley and Calabasas campuses. Currently the way the uh, systems are set up, you can't just plug and play backup power. Effectively an electrician has to come in, open up the panels, disconnect the existing service, integrate in the generator, and then power everything back up. It's a little bit of a time consu uh, uh, consuming and uh, an energy intensive process. Uh, there's various solutions that are out there to provide backup power, as many of you know. Uh, really the two major considerations are how long is the power out for and what are the cost implications of the different technologies. Things like battery storage are great for only a couple hour shutoffs, um, but looking at how the district's facing power shutoffs there, it's not really a viable solution. Plus there's five different electrical services across the two campuses, so you'd have to put batteries on each individual service. Looking at permanent generators, um, they're very costly. They're obviously fixed in location there, and if you're looking out right now at lead times in the marketplace, it's about a year to get a permanent generator. So you're gonna have a whole other academic year of facing power shutoffs and, uh, and issues there. So what we've looked at here is a plug and play type system using docking stations. So effectively, there's gonna be hardwired uh, connections ready at each meter for the, th the two campuses uh, to allow you to bring in a portable generator and immediately plug it in and have power ready to go. Um, and as part of this program, we're gonna have two portable generators included to power the main meters at each site. So you can start off with those permanently docked there. And then as years go on, and this uh, could be a technology to expand to other campuses, providing docking stations there, those generators can be moved to whatever sites have outages uh, for a relatively cost-effective solution for all your campuses. And then solar PV as well, looking at adding that to Calabasas. Here's an example of just kind of a typical shade structure. If you move to the next slide, that's where we're looking at positioning that solar array at Calabasas. This will effectively offset about 85% of the energy use at the campus. And then overall big picture kind of on the program, a few things to consider. You know, we touch on market volatility. Um, it's big issues out there with the supply chain right now, looking at between materials, equipment, labor costs. Typically we see those go up 10 to 12% year over year. We're seeing that in some instances quarterly on certain materials and equipment. Um, on the utility increase side, so PG&E has already been approved for a 13% rate increase next year alone. So looking at getting ahead of a a lot of the energy use of the district, again, 25% of it here at the district office, um, getting that taken care of ahead of that big cost increase. Uh, and then NEM 3.0, that's the net energy metering. Uh, the Public Utilities Commission is looking at changing that later this year, greatly affecting the economics of solar. So again, getting another campus out in front of that change here later this year. Looking at the preliminary phase one program financials, so turnkey price of $6.4 million, includes engineering equipment, labor, again, turnkey number there. Um, the procurement has already occurred through uh, your previous RFP. Um, life cycle savings, so this is the savings over the life of the equipment, so 15 years for energy efficiency and infrastructure, and 30 years for solar PV for the life, and that would be $10.5 million of savings over the life of the equipment. 
management. The funding sources would be from PG&E utility incentives, minimal there, uh, restricted district office uh, COP, similar to what Clinton mentioned. Again, the restricted funds for this property to really alleviate and change it into unrestricted general fund relief uh, for the rest of your campuses and lowering your overall utility operation here at the site. And then state Prop 51 funds, if you recall, um, the board actually passed a resolution in support of the bond dollars coming from the state and you'd be receiving funds back from Prop 51 that would actually be able to contribute to the facility improvements here as well. Beyond just the savings and the cost savings of the project and the critical needs, there's also environmental benefits to this program. And again, furthering the green initiatives of the district, just for example, on an annual basis, powering 80 homes here in Watsonville is the equivalent of the savings that you're going to be achieving through this phase one program. And then a lot of the improvements that are done through this program are um, on top of a roof or behind a, behind a wall or in, in a space that's not necessarily seen by the community. So it's about sharing that story and sharing the success of the program. So working in coordination with your PIO to actually uh, you know, share those stories, take pictures, drone shots, et cetera, depending on what the district would wanna have happen, but telling that success story as part of the program. And these are examples of what other districts have done as well. Uh, one key piece on that too is a part of the solar PV program, there's educational materials for the kids as well. And so they would get a uh, standalone solar PV um, demonstration and be able to have curriculum and other educational uh, elements a part of that as well for Calabasas. So the next steps, obviously we've, we've accomplished quite a bit here tonight, given a board information item, obtaining your feedback. Um, obviously moving forward, we'd finalize the program with your feedback in mind and then a potential board consent consideration um, in August 24th and then 12 to 18 months is the typical implementation you know pending market volatility on that as well but those are the next steps in terms of this type of program and with that we'll take any questions do we have any speakers to this item we do not okay um, are there any questions from the board on this project Dr. Daniel Thank you for the presentation. It was good, easy to understand, easy to read. Um, I saw you, you guys are planning a new solar project, I believe at Bradley, you said? At Calabasas. Calabasas. So my question is, I know at Watsonville High, they have solar panels. Are we seeing any type of results? Are we seeing any type of net gain from those solar panels at Watsonville High? Yeah, in terms of Watsonville High, this system is operating. We've taken a look at it. And also as part of additional phases that we're working with the district, we're looking at other enhancements at other sites, such as Watsonville High, Minty, LED lighting, things along those lines, mm -hmm. as part of utilizing some other state funding and other funding available to look at some of, even enhancing some of the energy savings at sites like Watsonville High School. So again, are we seeing any types of savings at Watsonville High School? Uh, as part of your existing uh, solar PV. Yeah. We can get you the exact numbers on that okay. in terms of that review, in terms of what the other company installed those panels yeah. years ago and mm -hmm. share that information with you. It, it'd be nice because I, I remember, I think, Clint, that we were talking you know, about you know, seeing what kind of energy or savings that we can get and put in, you know, putting, you know, whether it's rebates or cost savings, I, I, I think that'd be something I know, I'm not sure the truth, but I think it'd be something interesting that we could see so we could keep supporting projects like this instead of building it, but we're not seeing any results. Yeah, absolutely. So I can speak briefly on, um, for this building, for example, and Tyler can correct me if I get it completely wrong, but uh, we actually, shockingly, after this project with this building, we'll save almost around $300,000 annually mm -hmm. on this building alone. So the upgrades that would go into this building, you'd actually see immediate savings. And as um, Tyler mentioned, the solar PV at Calabasas would save about 85%, so that we could get the numbers on as well of what they're currently paying versus what we would see post-solar. 
And one of the key things here is what you mentioned, is proving the savings. Yeah. So at multiple other districts, even at Santa Cruz City Schools, phase four, roll in phase six. And what that means is m over multiple years, not only implementing projects, but showing the savings is actually occurring and happening for the district. And so part of our job is after this phase one, if we're fortunate enough to implement that, is to show that savings to the board and have reports, et cetera, as part of the program. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Trustee Holm. A uh, couple of comments and a question. Um, one, thank you for explaining that the funding for the district office projects comes out of that certificate of, of uh, participation funds. Correct. I know we've had a lot of uh, comments in the past from stakeholders expressing concerns about using general funds for a district office improvement, so I'm hoping that will reassure people that we're not using the general funds for that. Um, and I had also heard a, from many, many folks about the Bradley and Calabasas outages uh, when that was happening. So I really uh, appreciate the opportunity that this project provides for um, solutions to this issue. And um, thank you for the slide with information about the net savings. Um, I, I also know that the economy is a bit volatile right now. However, do you happen to have a projection for when we'll hit the point at which the changes will have paid for themselves? Yeah, so the lifetime cycle savings of 10 million is over 30 years, I believe. So um, uh, for the 6 million, it's gonna take roughly about 20 years to get that 6 million where it will have paid for itself. But again, part of the money we'll be using for Calabasas and Bradley is actually coming from a state reimbursement that's intended to be used on facilities and construction projects like this. And then of course our COPS, which is really the, what we're doing to this building is the majority of the savings we see annually, which is about that 300,000 um, ongoing. So. Thank you. Of course. Trustee Soto. Yeah, thanks for the information and uh, the presentation. Like uh, Trustee Dodge said, it's pretty, pretty clear. If, you know, from a, I'm just saying from my standpoint. You know, having the background in the trades and stuff. Uh, my question is, what's lead time lead time on implement, implementation on these systems by the time they're up and running? I mean, I know we've we're going through an assessment portion and uh, developing a scope. You know, I'm in planning and community development, and I know that, you know. The time people submit an application for a permit, you know, it takes several reviews, several departments. You know, it's and just an exa as an example, you know, it's not like going to the grocery store and picking up a piece of meat and taking it home and cooking it that night. You know, the cow has to be born, has to be raised, has to reach a certain age before it's ready for market, right? Okay. So construction is kind of the same way when you're trying to develop these types of programs. So just back to my question, just for clarification for the community, you know, how long before we actually physically see the system up and running? Good question on that, and you definitely know the background in terms of planning and how that works. So if we're fortunate enough to move forward in, in August on the project, we'd begin the DSA elements, you know, the Department of State Architect and pg &E and working with them to go through those types of processes and engineering, and then actually start that implementation and ordering of equipment. We've seen, you know, in the normal days, it was four to six weeks of heating and cooling equipment in terms of lead time. Now it's up to 20 to 24 weeks of lead time, so it's about Met, making sure that we order that as soon as we feel comfortable with the design and the approvals from DSA and, and going back to the implementation period, it's typically taking 12 to 18 months to implement similar programs like this um, from the start date in August to actually implement the program and see the results. And there will be certain measures that will be installed earlier than others, such as heating, cooling, building automation, and lighting. Those are typically installed sooner, but when it comes to solar PV, um, th those items are typically later because of the interface with PG&E and other state departments. And one more piece, just Oscar, along your questions, I know, of course, when we think about projects being delayed and the time is the increase as Tyler mentioned of the 12% we see you know, quarterly. Um, one of the nice things about partnering with Climatech is the quote that they give us in terms of materials, construction costs, the pieces that they're quoting us of what will happen. Now this doesn't include unforeseen costs like DSA or if PG&E had um, unforeseen costs on their end, but in terms of what Climatech will quote you at the um, following board meeting, that would actually be the price we pay. So you would actually see a price, there would not be change orders that go along with that saying, well, the price of this went up or the price of that went up. Um, Climatech actually takes on that risk when we do the contract with them. So. 
I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. Well, a comment and a question. So it's, it's nice to see that we're putting this together for Bradley and Calabasas families. I know that they struggled, or well, they have struggled with um, going without power for what felt like weeks at a time. Um, so that's exciting. Um, but given that it, it is going to take anything between 12 to 18 months for the full thing to be implemented, what's our backup, um, backup plan in the meantime? So again, we'll, we'll be, we did in the past when it happened with Calabasas and Bradley, when it happened early on, we actually found that there was some problems with our uh, UPSs, our um, universal power supplies over at uh, Calabasas and Bradley, which Dan Weiser did work with his team to get those actually up and running properly. They actually rerouted their infrastructure system to those power pieces. Um, at this time, as kind of was noted by Climate Tech, unfortunately, there is no plug and play system that we can just kind of go in and plug in a generator to power a school site. It just doesn't work as you would at your home and maybe attach a small generator. What we have to actually do is do infrastructure changes to their actual um, to the actual electrical grid there to actually be able to do a plug and play, which is what they'll be working on. And so um, I know I've expressed to Tyler and the team that Calabasas and Bradley, we want mm -hmm. up and running as soon as possible. That is our focus. Um, I do believe that hopefully in the, in the upcoming months, one is that we have done some changes on our end. And number two is PG&E has improved their process. We actually saw a lot of power outages, as you may have heard, due to squirrels being on the lines. And PG&E has assured us that they've actually fixed that ongoing problem. Okay. Thank you. Trustee Acosta. You want to go before me? Okay. Um, so I actually, I, and I think I'm going to direct this question to Dr. Rodriguez because um, I think this results on a decision that was made by about two boards back in November of 2018. And Maybe Trustee De Serpa and Orozco and I were here, but I'll direct a question specifically to Dr. Rodriguez. When the then board had voted to approve the purchase of the building, the DO, the towers, we had at that time, that board had also committed some money towards these upgrades that we're talking about now, right? With the boiler system, the heating, the cooling of, let's stay specific, just to the DO if we could. And is in, that is that if that's the way I recollect, and so I, think, I see Trustee Serpa taking her well, head. Yes. yes and and do we have that yes money and, to go yes and no? This? So, um, what they're referring to, the money that's being used, is the COPS money. So, what we did is we were able to purchase. So, for what we used to spend in rent, we were able to purchase have a monthly payment and have about $5 million worth of COPS money that were all part of then the overall cost of the mortgage, so to speak. Of the then purchase. Of the then purchase. So for we 30 were, years. For, um, I think it was 24, 25, I'd have oh, to okay. double check. Okay. Um, but so what we did is we did a cost, it was a little bit of a savings, but I'll just call it cost neutral, but I do believe it was a little bit of a savings. We were able, instead of just renting as we had for 15 years, um, we purchased and then was able to do this five million as well. Right. We never spent that five million, and now we're going to use this five million to then help alleviate other costs. That then means that our general fund won't have to be charged for this building, for, for this part building. of this of yep. what we're discussing this evening. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. good. So and four point seven million of the cops of the five million in cops is going to go towards this. And, and I just think that's an important point to mm -hmm. to, to bring out about a decision that was made. I mean, because, you know, mm -hmm. short term, um, it seems I know 2018 was a million years ago, but it wasn't. Um, but that's an important point to make. And and also to note, um, I, I think it was noted in the presentation that we have one school site here at the DO. We actually have two, two school with sites. With adult ed, yeah. Correct, located at the DO. Um, so it's important to note it's not just, I, and I think that was part of that, it's not just administrative personnel. We have many classified and certificated personnel as well as students 
on this campus here? Yeah, we only have about 25 um, administrators in this building, and we have 200 staff members in this building. And that 200 was total, I think, classified, certificate, administrative, yes. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. And that includes the two school sites. I take, or no, that's just probably DO. That, that's just DO staff. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, so, and then um, I just wanted to sort of piggyback on something. I'm, I'm not, I, I think it's where Trustee Orozco was going. I'm not sure if I, I felt it got fully answered for me. So I'll just ask it um, with regards to this implementation process, the 12 to 18 months. Um, and, you know, it's a concern here, too, of course, because we care about our employees and those that are here and our two school sites here, but also at Bradley and Calabasas. Um, we went through a very unfortunate situation not that long ago where we had a school site that went without heating and hot water during winter months, which should always be considered a totally unacceptable situation. So what are we, what in this process of being that long of a period of time, are, what assurances do we have that we're not going to have those problems for staff, teachers, administrators, our students, right, on these sites? Because we're talking three campuses, but also a total of at least four school sites. So the issues that occurred, if, you know, like if there's a disruption, I'm saying. Sure. Yeah. So the issues that occurred at Calabasas and Bradley, um, most of them were under 24 hours. So the reason why it felt poorly was because it happened um, one day and then a couple of days later it would happen again. And so I believe it was six, but it was a while ago, so my memory may not serve me right, but it was around six days that we had within about a 20-day period. So it was pretty consecutive, so it felt um, challenging. Um, during that time, we were fortunate because uh, most of those happened during warmer weather, and so we were able to be outside. We did purchase lanterns for classrooms. We also purchased um, specific lighting for the bathrooms so that the students could continue to go um, to the restroom um, because the water, although the pump um, is motivated by electricity, it has, I think, a three-day or something pr process, meaning it will continue to run for a pretty significant time. Um, and so I think what happened with PG&E is they had recalibrated right before school started. And so that caused the whole thing with the chipmunks and the squirrels and all that, that then were making the power go off. After they recalibrated it, we didn't have one shut off after that. So I'm hoping that we won't. Now, fire season could be bad, and then that is when we would do it. The reason why we didn't close prior, going, I'm trying to get to your point of, of being cold, um, we didn't close prior is because if we couldn't prove that we could have maintained open, we would have had to have done that day at the end of the school year. So we were required by law to give do 180 school days. Right. So unless we can get a waiver to, that says that we, without a doubt, were unable to remain open, um, then we have to make up that day. And so that's why we kind of continue to muddle through um, and keep school open um, because of that. Um, but if it was to happen in January, February, or sometime when it was very cold, we would have to make that determination and hope that we could get a waiver. And if we couldn't get a waiver, staff and students would have to know they would have to do it after school ended, um, which is never what people want. Um, and so we will take it day by day. As they mentioned, um, if the board, if we move forward and we approve this on the board on August 24th, then those are our priority sites. That's why we selected Bradley and Calabasas. And they'll be able to do it before the 18 months, because the 18 month lead time is the solar. That's what's gonna take us the longest. And so hopefully we'll be able to have it in place before we start having the shutoffs, but to be transparent, it's possible that we could have a shut off, a PG&E shut off before this is in place. It, it is possible, and we'll have to consider current conditions and then decide if we're going to um, close down the school and then possibly have to remake up that day. So, 
because this will be brought back on the August 24th meeting, not the next one in July. Um, yep. So we wouldn't be looking then to delay this to the next summer for summer projects when oh, students. Oh no! So there's sorry. I think I get what Justine Acosta is up. There won't be any downtime due to the projects being run at the site, so they won't be taking power down or anything due to the projects being run. And with the but it's also the what if. Yeah. I mean, even I, I know we can all live in a what if land forever, but. So we wouldn't be looking at this being a summer project for um, the summer of 2023? No, we would be looking at it starting as soon as possible. And also, okay. um, again, part of the reason of being here tonight mm -hmm. is for Climate Tech to kind of hear the board's concerns. So it's definitely something that Tyler and his team can look at in terms of providing the board with some assurities of this is what the project would look like, here's the stages we'll do it in to try and have the least amount of impact on the site, as mm -hmm. well as potentially making sure that the power pieces for Calabasas and Bradley are done as soon as possible. So that's what we'll be hearing in August? Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Right, thank you. Okay, um, so the COPs are like getting extra money, it's like a mortgage, right? It got folded in and we had the extra money to make improvements at, here at the towers. So am, what am, I, am I hearing that we're gonna take the money that is designated for the towers improvement and use it at Calabasas and Bradley? No. no so okay, the, so yeah, let's, let's. Yeah, so the cops um, of about 4.7 million is what the, this building will cost. And to Trustee Acosta's question, we, to be very clear, the money that we are using for the district office can only be used for the district office because it is those COPs. The prop. Um, that's what I thought, yeah. That's the additional funding that the board had supported that resolution to support the bond, the statewide bond. We did get some reimbursement from that. Item. That is what I want to know. So, so did we get reimbursement on on PV High and all of the other projects that we've done we already? We have not gotten on all of our projects. So far we've had two of our Measure L projects that we've seen reimbursements for, which is Valencia and Aptos Jr. at this time. So those are the two that we've seen that we've actually been able to reimburse. Now, some of our projects were because they weren't eligible, so it wasn't necessarily that every site would get reimbursed, it's the ones that were eligible. So we picked projects where we thought we could get the most money back on our eligibility, and that's what we worked with um, school facility consultants to try and find that biggest bang for our buck. Um, last I actually saw, it's up to about four million that we may get in state. Um, in Prop 51, so we'll actually have some more money from that as well to be utilizing at some of our sites. Um, the COPS also, the board may remember, not too long ago, a few months back, we actually refinanced our COPS as well, which actually saved us some money ongoing as well on our COPS, so actually allowed us to take what was originally there back in 2018 and actually improve upon how much we're actually receiving for this building. Okay, what I'd like you to do is come back with a report on all of the reimbursements that we're getting from measure, or sorry, from Prop 51. And then we, even before Prop 51 passed, there was other things that we had put in for that was supposed to, right? We did. And we were waiting and waiting and we were on the list for, I think, PB High and some other things. Uh, I can definitely check on PB High. I know that we had, as I noted, That's Valencia and Atos Jr. And those two, even though they were in before Prop 51, what Prop 51 allowed was for the state to be able to fund their hundreds of millions of unfunded projects, those two being two of the unfunded. Okay, because I know that we had put in for a, a whole lot of different things under Measure L yeah. that we were waiting for in, in back of like a, a really long list. Yeah, and so what ends up happening, unfortunately, is as, as we get as we don't receive approval on those, the state continues to reevaluate projects and say, now is this something that meets the criteria? We found that quite a few projects did not end up meeting the criteria to get okay. reimbursements for. I can definitely work with um, school facilities. They, they yeah, have them project. maybe come and talk about yeah, the criteria absolutely. to us so I can understand absolutely. that because we were waiting and waiting. Well, it's good to know we have, four, is it four million in the, in our pocket or we're, we're waiting? Not yet. Okay. We're, we're, Colleen and I keep watching and waiting for it. They tell us that they told us about four to six weeks, but. To me, it feels like that was four to six weeks ago, but I think in reality it was about two weeks ago. I'm just being impatient. <laughs> okay. Um, so that's all good news. 
So here in the towers, I know we were gonna replace the roof, the HVAC, do some remodeling, and secure all our entryways. Wh which of those things have been done? Right. So we actually, um, thankfully, Herlindo worked pretty diligently um, to get a hold of our door people. They actually have now implemented some of the new locks on the ICAMP doors, as well as the special education doors, as well as our kind of side doors in this hallway right here. So that project is still moving forward. And then we have been doing minor repairs across the building using some of our cops so when we have leaks on the roof. But um, the other big piece would be this, which would be the HVAC, the controllers, repairing the duct work, as well as upgrading the boiler and the AC. Okay. And the big piece, which is what, um, in looking at what we had allocated for cops, was the largest purchase that this building was going Okay. And normally Steve Akimoto would come, I hope I said his name right, um, come and give us um, an overview of how much money was saved because of all the solar we've already put in, et cetera, and all the monitoring of, of the school sites. Um, who's going to be giving those um, I can work reports with, now? I, I can work with Climate Act and her window to make sure that the board can get those reports of where okay. the savings we're seeing from our solar, as well as, especially from this project, as noted by Tyler, part of the requirement of this project is for Climate Tech to show that we actually are receiving savings, which is how we were able to. Right, because I don't want it to just, I mean, Absolutely. if there are savings in, and we're seeing that to the general fund, then the board should reprioritize some of some things that are important. Um, okay, and then I'll just say one more thing, which is, um, Recently, I had um, a cabinet about this big put in front of my property, um, and it's through utilities. It's battery backup so that if all of the electricity goes down, I'll have 72 hours of battery backup, and I guess that's um, a new mandate from the CPUC. I, I think I said that right. Um, I didn't approve it, it just went in, so I was mad about it at first, but I understand why it's going in all over the county now. Um, so will the batteries, it sounds like you're gonna have battery backup then at Calabasas and at Bradley. They'll be mobile generators. They won't be battery backup because the mobile, the battery backup as Tyler had mentioned, in looking at it, to actually power that large of a site with all of the facilities that site has, would not be viable through battery backup. It, it was effectively very cost prohibitive. We wouldn't be able to actually power. And as they noted, it would require multiple batteries because there are actually multiple lines there that would need to be connected. So we aren't doing battery, We're, we went with mobile and two, the point that was made, we had actually talked, uh, Tyler and I sat down about doing a permanent solution versus a mobile. We thought the mobile made more sense because if Calabasas and Bradley start seeing less power outages, but we are able to do some of our other sites that have had power outages, we wouldn't have to necessarily buy another mobile generator because we could have our maintenance crew pick it up, take it over to a site, plug it in once those sites have been. So both of those sites will have solar, Bradley has it already, and Calabasas will get it. So what about doing like a Tesla Powerwall situation so that you don't have to have a generator like dealing with carbon footprint, that kind of thing? Right. I don't really love the idea of having a generator run a school. Right, and so when you're looking at overall cost, so battery storage is a, still a newer technology, and when you're looking at the size of the battery storage that's required for the loads of you know the property, 160 kW type for just one meter, and then you're going and you add the other meters, it does get cost prohibitive, especially when you're looking at whole site solutions and connecting all the meters together if you wanted to consolidate it, it starts creating a microgrid, and that can get very costly. The incentives from the state have ran down to very little um, for these types of programs. It's called the Self-Generation Incentive Program, mm -hmm. which is very little or is already having a, on a wait list uh, for that type of funding, so it's not subsidizing the batteries as much. Um, and again, cost and what the mar where the market is, um, it's a very costly solution versus the portable temporary so or portable solution right now. Okay. I would like you guys, if you could, to investigate that and see if there's any companies that are willing to do rebates for school systems. I am... Um, I think it's a better idea than a generator, and if we're gonna spend the money, I'd rather spend it once than have to go back and put something else in later. Yeah, we, we'll do more research in terms of where the funding is, but the main the main pot is the SGIP program um, for public schools, and so there's really limited to no funding in that pot. Because I think um, we'll with see our, if there's anything else. That's great. Because I think with those solar arrays, we're putting money, we're putting energy back into the grid when we could be saving it and using it um, when we need it. 
Right, and one of the key things with solar power is when, when the uh, power, outages, power outages do occur from PG&E, it actually shuts off the solar PV system for safety reasons. And so again, looking at that microgrid infrastructure, bringing in the other two uh, meters, let's say at Calabasas where there's three. So we'll, we'll take a look at that and, and come back with some information Great. and share that with staff. Okay, thank you. President, trustee, to serve, I just had one quick question that came up to my mind based on something you had said. I want to just ask uh, Dr. Rodriguez real quick. So because we are talking about three different campus site locations, will this be broken down financially for the board's approval to each site location for the transparency to say that yes, what we're using, which was agreed on back in 2018 on the purchase of the towers, is being used there, not being used at Bradley, not being used at Calabasas, and also of course the warrants to match with that when the payments are made that would be all the yeah. Um, great question. Absolutely. We will break down when they actually go through and we do the um, funding, finalizing the scope and the funding, we'll break it out by each site of what the cost will be. And then uh, when we present it to the board in August, I can also make sure that we attach the funding source to each of those dollars Perfect. so that it's very clear to the public and the board what we're using to fund each of those projects. I appreciate that. Thank of you. Of course. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, do you want to make a motion? Yeah. I'd like to um, do something that we have uh, some guest speakers that are here tonight, and I don't want them to wait any longer. So I'm going to make a motion to move up next on our agenda, item 9.6, which is the Bruce W. Wolpert Algebra Academy. Looking for a second? I'll second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone abstention or opposed? Thank you. Next up, we have item 9.6. Yeah, so I'd like to ask up to the podium, um, Christy Sessions, who's the executive director of the Wolpert Algebra Academy, and also Ms. Rose Ann Wolpert, who is the founder of that academy. So for many, many years, we've been very fortunate to be able to have a really incredible partnership, which allows um, our eighth grade students from Wixa, Cesar Chavez, E. Hall, um, Lakeview, Pajaro, and Rolling Hills be able to be part of this academy. And so because it's such a unique process and a unique partnership with Granite Rock and CSU and B um, and CSU C UCSC, um, we've asked them to come and just feel really highlight and put a spotlight on this incredible program. So thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you so much. Do you want to start, Roseanne, or do you want me to? Sure. Well, uh, thank you for your invitation. It's um, really uh, an appropriate week to be here because it was 10 years ago on Friday that Watsonville lost it, a, a tremendous supporter of public education. Mm -hmm. So Bruce Wolper was uh, born in Watsonville, Watsonville uh, Hospital. He was a student at McQuitty School. He went to EA Hall and graduated from Watsonville High, went on to UCLA and Stanford. He was a math major at UCLA and loved mathematics. And he, he used to talk all the time about his experiences in schools in Watsonville. So um, as the, after he graduated from um, Stanford, he went on to work for Hewlett Packard and eventually came back to the family business, Granite Rock. He was CEO there for 25 years. And while he was CEO, he did everything he could to support the education in this valley. And one of those things was uh, 12 years ago, he invited the eighth graders from Rolling Hills Middle School to come to Granite Rock and have professors from CSUMB come and tutor them in mathematics. So when Bruce died, we decided that there was no better way to remember him. A building made no sense for Bruce Wolpert. It was education. So that's when we decided to incorporate the Bruce W. Wolpert Algebra Academy, expand it, hire an executive director, and collaborate with CSUMB, UCSC, um, San Pino County, 
is also involved in this, but the, this district has been a major collaborator with, uh, also I wanted to mention, it was not just Granite Rock, it's also Driscoll's Berries has uh, been involved in the program as well. So it's a really a unique and tremendous collaboration on all levels. And over these last 12 years, I don't know, it's been over a thousand students yes. have gone through this program. And what is really exciting for us at Granite Rock is that we're starting to hire graduates of this program. They've come back and working for us and that is really one of the um, a major objective is that we want local kids to get a good education and be able to come back and work in good paying jobs right here in our communities. So um, really appreciate this district supported the program, and um, it's we're looking forward to. And I and I just want to make a plug for Christy, who, as as we all know, these last two years have been tremendously challenging. Christy had to learn a whole new way of teaching, just all of, like your educators did, and she's been able to pull it off. And this August, we're back. We're going to be back in person again, and we hope that that will continue over the next who knows how many years. So um, anyway, just a little bit of background, hope, hopefully not too uh, verbose. <laughs> no, that's wonderful. I don't know how I can possibly expand on what she said. <laughs> She's so eloquent And speaking of the history. Um, I joined the Algebra Academy in 2016, and since then we've been able to expand to 15 schools and four local school districts. And I'll give you just a little bit more detail about what it is that we specifically do. We do partner with the universities, CSUMB and UC Santa Cruz, and one of the main components of our program is that those um, university professors come and they teach our students. So they're exposed to university level instruction. They bring TAs from the universities as well, and they get that exposure, which is really important. So they have the business exposure, they have the university exposure and they are in groups of like-minded kids so if I can back up our program is an enrichment program so we recruit the highest performing most highly motivated math students in your district and those students are recommended by your seventh grade teachers by the principals and those students all come together and we're able to give them an opportunity that they can't get in the normal classroom they have professors TAs we invite the eighth grade teachers as well we have high school alumni that come and work for us as well so in a classroom of maybe 25 students all learning intensive math they might have eight or nine adults who are in that classroom with them supporting them and that's just not something that they can get in a classroom as much as we would all love that it's just not possible so we're able to give that to these kids and it's something that we are so so proud of so they get to be around other kids like them they love math they're good at math and we get to show them that this is what you can do this is what you can be we have people co who come and they speak from Granite Rock they speak from Driscoll's and they talk about their experiences in school and how math led them to where they are and it's just a really neat immersive experience that we are so proud of and so we're very grateful to be able to come here tonight and share with you I don't know that we've been to one of your board meetings to share about our program but here we are in it's year several years several years has ago it? We were here. before yes. my time <laughs> yeah. but we're in program year number 13 so this is a celebration for us to again to be back in person but thank you again for the opportunity to come and speak and we look forward to another great year Thank you. Thank you. If you'll stand for questions, that would be great. Do Absolutely. we have any speakers to this item? Give me one second. Mm -hmm. Do you need the number 9.6? No, no speakers to this item. Okay. Or do we have any comments or questions from the board? Daniel? I would just like to thank both of you for what you do for putting this academy together. Uh, thank you, Bruce Wolport, for being a visionary. You know, it, it's easy, you know, to put a name on a wall, but it, it's, it takes a vision to keep your legacy alive. And no better way to support where you went to school than giving a lifeline for our children. So I, I just wanted to say, you know, thank you, Rose and Bruce, for being a visionary for our children. And also giving our children, um, I would say, like, a heads up, like, 
you take these children for Watsonville, these schools where math isn't always cool, but you give them a safe place to say, hey, come here. Like, we, we support what you're doing, and by the way, keep pursuing your education, and we might have something for you here that'll, that'll help you, your family, when you, you know, if you ever have one, but come back, and we'll be here, so thank you very much. Thank you. I just, I just wanted to uh, add one aspect that we forgot to mention about the program, and that is that we uh, some of the schools have been able to uh, put together math festivals in the schools. And I guess I would have to say Rolling Hills has been really the, the model for that. And what these eighth grade students do is teach the younger students about math and play games with them that are that, encourage math and it and as you said it makes math cool and so that's just icing on the cake <laughs> yes thank you um, this had been in a consent agenda and I actually pulled it up and wanted it to be heard um, live because there's a lot of people that watch this um, out in the community thank you. Um, Bruce was a friend um, to me personally. Um, if you wanted to be on the school board in the day, you had to go in front of Bruce and a cadre of <laughs> Watsonville's <laughs> finest, and they would ask you a million questions, right? There was former superintendents on there and prominent business people from all walks of life, and you had to go in front of them, answer a lot of questions, and then get an endorsement. And after that event happened, I did get their endorsement, I'm very proud to say. Um, but after that event, Bruce and I would meet um, probably quarterly for breakfast, and and I would invite other people to come to those meetings, including Mr. Beecher, who who is a, also a, sort of a watchdog for public education. And um, I just Rosanna, I really miss him. He was a wonderful human being, and um, this legacy is is quite amazing. Thank you. Yeah. So thank you for caring about our kids, and I'm glad to, to see you tonight. I do have a question. Are, are any of these students followed um, long, long, longitudinally to see if they're going to college or what's happening? That's a great question, and that's something that we were looking into pretty pretty heavily right before COVID happened, <laughs> and how we can look at um, our monitoring long term. Mm -hmm. As of this point, no, but that is something that's definitely been on my radar because I think that would be incredible to be able to see. Yeah, um, one of the things that was really important about having this Algebra Academy is that the um, professors have come here in the past, I've been on the board 12 years now, had come here in the past and told us that the kids that were coming out of PBUSD were not ready for college in math. They were, and they, they gave us a wake up call and we started really working on that. And part of the working on it wasn't just for the kids that are high flyers, but for all kids. So, um, so anyway, so that was um, a consequence or a realization that, that the, this particular program brought to us. So anyway, thank you. Thank, thank you for that. I, I would just um, just let people know if they're not aware that they're, uh, we've also established scholarships in Bruce's name at CSUMB for, uh, and high priority, number one priority is Algebra Academy graduates, number two is Pajaro Valley uh, students scholarships are available and I hope that uh, we have more and more take advantage of those. Thank you both for coming tonight. Can I just say a comment? Sure, yeah, Trustee Rose. Yeah, so I just want to thank both of you for coming tonight. Uh, my nephew actually was part of the Algebra Academy. He just graduated from PB High School and moving on to UC Santa Cruz. And so I just remember him really excited, feeling excited because he was going to be bused to a location with um, everyone else who was part of um, his cohort. Um, so I know he, he benefited tremendous, tremendously from the Algebra Academy, um, and I think it just opened opportunity opportunities for him and opened his eyes to um, the possibilities mm -hmm. and for sure encouraged him to continue on to higher ed. So um, thank you so much um, for doing that and, and then for also establishing that scholarship. I think... Um, I think oftentimes um, families are really unaware of 
how affordable college can be if we just take a little bit of time to do that extra research and apply to as, to as many scholarships as possible. So thank you for um, the opportunity um, and um, I just I'm excited to, to see it continue to grow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so very much. much. Okay. The first and the second. Okay. I need a motion to approve. Move for approval. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Motion carries unanimously. Thank Great. you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Okay, moving back up to item 8.2, our ELSB grant annual report and update. Good evening, President De Serpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Tonight, I am here to provide the annual report and update on the implementation of the Literacy Action Plan um, that follows the ELSB um, grant. And so, as you may recall, the grant was not a, um, it was not intended for all schools. It actually required the CDE to fund and award funds um, to the 75 schools with the with the highest number of third grade students at the lowest achievement level on our standardized test um, in language arts. Right. And so, really, the the goal of the the grant was to make sure that we are developing and implementing instructional practices that are sound for literacy and those support, stru um, support structures in place for TK third. Um, and as, um, as far as a lead educational agency, we have been um, supported by the Sacramento County Department of Education along with their partners, um, Pivot and Core. So as you can recall, the three sites that received this funding, um, the three that, that um, were approved for and awarded, Amesti Elementary, Calabasas, and Radcliffe. So as we're looking at this, um, tonight I will cover um, the four categories of the grant. So the funds can only be used on certain things um, that were identified in their literacy action plan, which you um, reviewed um, last year. And then tonight I will quickly go through the accomplished actions from the literacy um, action plan. I will also cover the SMARTY goals that their leadership teams from each one of the three sites actually developed. Um, during their planning year last year and the results. And then we will review next steps and revisions to continue the work based on the data. All right, so the, the three categories, the first one is access to high quality literacy instruction, making sure that that core instruction is taking place um, from evidence-based um, instructional practices and curriculum. Number two is that support to make sure that is happening in the classroom and we're having that ongoing professional development um, and support. And then again, pupil supports and that's, um, how can we best utilize the day and support our students in a variety of, of ways? And then number four, we know how important that family and community um, piece of it is. And so as we move on, we will cover the first, these, um, I'm going to cover each one of those categories and really the actions that the team had committed to. So that first one is making sure that we hired curriculum coaches or literacy coaches for all three of the sites. And so that was done and their focus, the actions for them were to make sure that we really focused on the data analysis and looking at where our students are um, at all of those levels, meaning the core area, the students that need more support, and even the students that need additional. Um, and also providing additional um, professional development in that early literacy piece with foundational skills, and that could be Phonetica or SIPS. Phonetica would be supporting that, um, that dual language piece at a site like Amesti along with SIPS. 
And then the third piece of it really is those intentional community um, learning communities where the focus really is on instruction and a collaborative model um, with the grade level teachers and teams where they're looking at how our students are doing based on data and going through a protocol, um, looking at student artifacts and really using um, an IPP, um, which is known as our intellectual preparation protocol um, with the curriculum. And then fourth is that really important piece of going through that um, plan, do, study, act model of really um, looking at that, that the lessons and the purpose and supporting all learners, especially our English learners, and making sure that that ongoing modeling and demonstration and lesson study is happening. And so number two, we have support for for literacy, right, and learning. So first of all, as you can see, we really focused on intervention teachers and instructional assistants, especially the new ones that we added to make sure that we are providing, they are providing distributed practices, right? So we're using our intervention teachers a, a different way to, to be able more efficiently and inside the classroom often um, to really focus on specific areas of need um, and being extremely intentional. And so the next one is providing professional development, right? Building that capacity and sustainability, which is really important and is really the essence of this grant too, right? And so we also provided that professional development on the science of reading. So we have the best strategies in place. And number three, is now using those, um, being able to supplement and, and add additional materials for intervention to support practicing and fluency. All right. And so now we have category three. Um, we have pupil support. So we really focused on making sure that we reached out and continued that continuity of learning throughout the in, in the day, which extended into extended learning. So we did partner with extended learning. Um, Nicole Marsh, who is our early literacy coordinator, really partnered with the site coaches and were able to train the extended learning staff in some of these distributed practices with the literacy. So if students needed after school some additional support with phonological awareness, they're going to pull them and give them that support. If they need um, a little bit of extra help with fluency, they're going to pull them. And we really focused on just one or two strategies and we'll be continuing the work next year. And then second is that um, is implementing it, right? It's one thing to train. And then it's a second thing to make sure we're implementing and providing the coaching too. So that's where the site literacy coaches come into play. As you can see, um, our coaches are up there in that picture with some of our, um, our intervention teachers and IA supporting that work. And then lastly, since it is pupil support, it does go into social emotional learning and behavior too, because we know that they go hand in hand with academics. So one of the strategies, it's a tier two approach, it's called check in and check out to support um, our students and making sure that they have an adult on campus to check in and to support a specific need or a behavior. And our fourth category is that family and community support piece, right? To make sure we're engaging our parents. And so we are so thrilled that we have three, we've hired three um, family or parent, I have family engagement specialists, but they're parent engagement specialists up there that are supporting the sites. And so all one of the goals or one of the actions they said that they were going to do is make sure that they are hosting um, family literacy nights and events. And they were able to um, host um, in-person um, literacy nights this year, which is a huge success. And then also we have been, they have been utilizing um, the parent engagement specialist to also partner with families in an area of really connecting with them in MTSS, being able to call them and make sure that they're coming to the MTSS improvement plan meetings or to partner with them to see what some of those obstacles are um, that are getting in the way of our students being um, successful at school. 
And so here, I love this as a quick little collage um, from all three of the sites, and they all hosted it in their in their different ways. Um, and then that's the power of that collaborative piece too, because now they they were able to share out their best practices and findings and what worked the best for our parents. So now we're moving on. So again, those were the actions, the key actions that they really committed to, and they were successful implementing them even um, coming back, right? Our first year back um, from, the, from the pandemic and in person, which is a great success. And so now we had, they had to also, as part of their literacy action plan, come up with two to three SMARTY goals, right? And you're wondering, what is a SMARTY goal? Well, the SMARTY goals stand for, um, this specific so we want to make sure their goals are very specific it will help them know when they've reached them measurable right we want to be able to measure the progress so we don't have we wait until the end and we're like oh we're not we're not getting the results or able to step in and support and then attainable, we want to make sure that the goals are uh, stretch goals, right? But that they are attainable. And then relevant, we want to make sure that they are important and, and most critical for our students. Time bound, right? And then equitable, we want to make sure that it enhances the equity for our students so they have access to being able to um, achieve. So looking at our the first SMARTY goal that was developed by um, the teams, they came up with one that really focused on the collection of making sure we had a universal screener. So we had re reliable data um, that often that would also match some of our diagnostic data or map data. So we had. Um, different measurements and metrics and that we were able to administer them right and we were also able to calendar them the head of, ahead of time and collect that data and have conferences so as we're thinking about that, we were able to accomplish that this year. Each one of the sites were able to administer Dibbles um, three times a year, our universal screener in fall, winter, and spring. And so this is one of the overall reports as a sample. They were also able to hold data review and analysis team meetings, looking at that data in their grade levels um, with their coaches um, and their administrators, really looking at what how they can step in and do next steps and be responsive and we followed a protocol which was um, called the DRT or the data review team meeting that really helped us look and ask ourselves those questions and being really curious and then coming up with practical action plans that can be measured for all um, all levels of students and then the assessment calendar and collection forms were also um, were also being able to, they were implemented. So everyone knew when things were happening, right? They had those, those templates and forms that were uniform. Number two, we also really focused again around that distributed practice, right? You can start seeing the actions matching the, the SMARTY goals too. So, the SMARTY goal two really centered around improving their skills and distributed practice and interventions in each tier. So that means even the classroom teacher being able to know what that, that quick distributed practice when you're done with one group, then you're helping a couple of the kids or a few kids with something their immediate need with a little bit extra practice. If you think of it as terms of like soccer, right? You know that the coach is playing with, uh, or coaching the whole team at the same time and mixing in different drills, but then they're noticing that one of this one of their um one of the members on the team, right, that they're coaching needs a little bit extra help with dribbling, right? So they're gonna give, provide the extra practice in dribbling throughout the day or just pulling them over for a, quick, a few minutes, but you're not taking away the rest of the practice, right, or the instruction that the coach would give to their students. And so really we focused on all the areas of reading there in different ways, depending on what those students needed and really focusing on um, using those artifacts as intentional, with their intentional learning communities, the grade levels that are working on um, planning next steps for their students, and also with their site leadership team as well. And they were able to accomplish that. And so you can see, 
just some examples of our literacy coaches who were modeling some of these distributed practices and also sometimes we were video they were being videoed so then they could also expand right those best practices for intervention teachers or um, for classroom teachers and those are our our wonderful coaches we have Kat Bermudez um, at Amesti we have Elizabeth Turnbull at um, Calabasas and Jennifer Connery over at Radcliffe. And then SMARTY goal number three, we have that focus on um, improving student um, comprehension instruction using high quality, right, grade level complex text by receiving training on strong tier one implementation of benchmark, um, which is our core program, and then measured by our results on our MAP data, our Dibbles or EDEL, and then other formative assessments throughout the year. And so we were able to do that as we're looking at some of the results, you're going to see just a quick snapshot from each one of the sites on their overall um, kindergarten through third grade results on their dibbles to show um, just that, that indicator um, of growth and then next steps also. So again, this is our first year with full, with full implementation of using dibbles. Um, and so if you're looking up at this one, this this gives you three different times of year. On the left, it starts with, um, and this is combining again kindergarten through third. So it's just a quick snapshot. Um, and so you can see the number of students that entered this year that needed intensive support, right? Which is the red. The yellow is strategic support. And then the core and the course, um, the core plus or core negligible, those are the students that are where that are where we want them to be, right? Where they're gonna be the least at risk. Um, and so right now, the good thing is being able to look at this data and be like, okay, so let's look deeper. So there's different levels to look at to see what the students need and to see and to make sure they are growing um, when we give them what they need. And so you will see in the, at the left side, it's fall, the winter is in the middle, and our spring is um, on the right side. So as you're looking at, here are some of the key findings as we go, as the teams went through the data. We did notice overall when it's broken up into um, groups that K through three decreased students need in need of intensive support by 12 to 27% from fall to spring, meaning some grade levels, right, were able to reduce that number of students that needed intensive support from 12 and some did it by 18 and some even did it by 27. So if you're thinking about it, anything more than 10%, I know it, lo it sh looks like we need a lot, to, a lot of work to do, we do, but anything over 10% is huge, right? It means it's, or it's significant, right? It means what we're doing is helping. Um, and then we, of course we have next steps. The next one is our first grade at the school site. They were able to decrease students needing intensive support by 27%. So that's huge. If we're thinking about last year, these are the students that were online, right, in kindergarten, coming into first grade, and we were able to, to decrease that. So those are good steady gains that we wanna continue. Um, what they are doing is working. And then as you're looking at that overall K-3, we reduced, um, they were able to reduce students in need of intensive support by 16%, and then we're able to also increase core plus by 9% as an overall, right? So that's the combination of the green and the blue, right, um, um, needs. And then as we're moving on to Calabasas, now you, now you understand a little bit how to, how to read it, so I'll go a little quicker. Um, you can see some of the highlights where K-3 grade levels all decrease the number of students needing intensive support by at least 10% or more. We also found that first grade decreased the number of students um, needing intensive support from 87 to 47. 
right? So that's huge again, that first grade. They're really, and part of that is they're getting the SIPs, but then since we got the, we looked at, they looked at the data and analyzed it early on from fall, they said, you know what? We have this many students. This is a huge amount that need more than just the regular core. We need to look and see as a class, what do they need um, like 10 minutes more of instructionally? And then we'll see who needs the smaller group instruction. And then when we're looking at number three, overall decreased students in need of intensive support by 17% and increased their core by 11%. And then we're moving on to, lastly, our Radcliffe. So kinder, first, and third grades were able to decrease the, the number of students in need of intensive support by at least 20%. So we have a, a lot of the grade levels that are going way beyond that 10. And then reducing the intensive number of students by 2%. So this is um, our uh, one of the grade levels. It was um, second grade. And so that tells us, okay, there's something that the students are coming into um, in, at that grade level that need more support. And how do we dig deeper with diagnostic um, and see what they need. And then lastly, if you're looking at the overall um, decrease of students in need of intensive support by 15%, and they were able to increase students at core by 6%. So the schools are moving forward, but they all have their own um, obstacles and plans. So their teams came together and they developed their SMART goals and, and metrics for next year as they're moving forward. So as you're looking at this, this is qu a quick um, glimpse at their map data. So this is, again, this is their, our first year back in person, right, since the pandemic. So this is kind of like our baseline again, right, because we want to see growth for the next couple years and um, moving our students forward. The same thing with, our, with the Dibbles. So we see a Mesty there. We have 25% of the students in second grade met um, their, their growth target. That's what that means. Wherever they came in, 25% of them met it. In third grade, we have that um, the 21% again. And as we're moving to Calabasas, we see 44% in second grade and 33 in third. So one of the patterns that we did notice right, is that our third graders, right, they were the ones, again, that were, if we're thinking about the pandemic, they were originally kindergartners, right, too, and so that has been the grade level that we know that we're going to continue to need to support um, as the second graders are moving on. Um, and then our um, Radcliffe, we have our 30% that met their growth target, and in third grade, 34 and then so for this next upcoming year, the learnings, revisions, and next steps, they're going to focus on that phonological awareness, phonemic awareness piece to be able to really um, work on their oral language development um, with a supplemental piece that will um, that will be provided. It takes about 10 or 12 minutes, and we it will be um, they will be looking at this piece to help. Um, support the students and that's really f what we found the last couple years on our early our diagnostic assessments and from Dibbles. Um, and then, of course, we will be um, having demonstration lessons and lesson studies around um, our benchmark advanced in Adelante, and it will really be a focus on the sites um, have really wanting to focus on this core piece because, again, um, coming back from the pandemic, some of those pieces look different, right, when it's in person, and to really focus on that ELD piece of our core cur curriculum, too. And lastly is what we've noticed, putting in um, systematic fluency routines to build up the automaticity of our students. So when they do get to complex text, they are able to focus on comprehension, right? All right, so that concludes uh, my report. Um, are there any questions? We have no speakers through this item. Any questions? That was a very comprehensive report. Thanks. We thank you.
right. thank you. Good to see what's happening out there actually to help our earliest um, students get ahead. We, isn't it true that if kids aren't reading by like second grade, they have a very difficult time? Yeah, or third grade. So this is really, really important. Yep. And the intervention teachers that we saw there, those are intervention teachers, correct? Those were or intervention just, teachers with our literacy coaches. With literacy coaches. So it's part of building the capacity so our sites can do the work when they no longer have, when the grant's no longer there, so we're not relying on systems that we can't sustain. And just one, remind me again, this is a three-year grant? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're going into year two now. Yep. Okay, and then will we have like um, some actual results at the end? Are we gonna follow the kids through to, th yeah. Every year I'll come back That's and continue great. updating you every single year on their actions, their goals, and their results. Great, thank you. I have a comment just really okay. quickly. It's great to see the double-digit growth. I know that's hard. Um, so it's, it tells me that it's working. Um, and it takes really a village, right? Um, I guess just one, um, something to think about. It would be great if, you know, some of this work could start at the preschool level. So I don't know how we can make that happen. <laughs> but it is, you know, if, I think if, if the earlier we start this type of work, I think the more prepared students are going to be by the time they hit kinder. I'm so glad you said that. That'll come up a little bit later. So please, <laughs> please <laughs> consider that. <laughs> I know. Thank you. Okay, um, next we have under action items, item 9.1, the approval of our 2022 local control accountability plan or otherwise known as the LCAP. Yes, thank you. Good evening, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. The last morning board meeting, I presented the draft 2022-23 Local Control Accountability Plan. It was also placed on the district website for public questions or comments. And uh, as of this evening, that there were no um, comments or um, questions from the public. And so with that, I'm, staff is asking that you approve the 2022-23 Local Control Accountability Plan for approval. Any speakers? No speakers to this item. Okay, any comments or questions from the board about the LCAP that was presented? No, I'm all moved to approve. A second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Or abstaining? Thank you. Okay, thank you. <coughs> item 9.2, the 2022-2023 proposed budget and the 2021-2022 estimated actuals. Thank you, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. As was presented at our last board meeting, uh, you did see the budget for the 22-23 school year as along with our estimated actuals. This is the time now that we ask the board to approve these in accordance with ENCODE to have a balanced budget by June 30th of um, before the start of the new year. I'd also like to take just a couple minutes, I know I have three, but I'll keep it under, to just say thank you so much to the finance staff. They do so much hard work during this time, and I know that they don't come up here and speak, and you don't get to see them, but they do a lot of work, and that's, of course, Colleen Bugion and her department, which consists of Olga Castro, uh, Teresa Battle, Carmen Calderon, uh, Sherry Bowers, um, Vicky, Oh, excuse me. We also have uh, Margarita Ponce and Erica Padilla. They are all great staff accountants. All of them do a lot of hard work to get this budget done. And it's unfortunately, as you all saw in May, we get a May revise and then we have to kind of build a budget off that. So they really do work very, very hard. I mean, all year long, long but really April through May, they're really cracking down and um, they put in a lot of effort to make sure this happens. So, and sorry, it was Vicki Davis. I coughed and didn't get to get her name out. But So anyway, I asked board for approval of the budget for the 22-23 school year as well as our estimated actuals. She needs a motion. Oh, are we, okay. Does anyone have, there's no speakers? No speakers. Anyone have questions about the budget? Jen? 
Are there any updates on the legislature and the governor? No, so the governor technically has, as we always know, he has 12 days, which should have been actually around today that he's supposed to sign. They always find a way in the law to allow him not to sign and to be able to delay it just a little bit longer. Um, so we expect still prior to June 30th because legislature always finds a way to get themselves paid. So they always end up signing before June 30th. So. No, I'm good, thank you. Okay. Trustee Dodge Jr. Thank you, Clayton, Colleen, and your team for uh, putting these budgets together. I know it's hard, but I know you guys do your best that you can. Uh, just quickly, when, when do you think we'll start seeing the effects of declining enrollment? So, as I kind of presented at the last board meeting, um, the the state has recognized declining enrollment, so we're actually seeing it now. We're seeing it just from um, each year that we go down. We're able to have an average of our ADA now, assuming that does pass, which it seems like it will, um, which slows it down a little bit, but the fourth year out, um, we'll still really start to see it again because then we won't have those kind of years of protection that we get to use as higher ADA. So I would say third or fourth year out. So probably the first time we'll see a bigger dip is 24-25 like two years you would say yeah I would say sorry two years it's this year not the following year it's that third I consider it the third year out but yes two actual years out thank you that way the community knows what's going on and we're just trying to get ahead of the curve so thanks okay did I'm looking for a motion did we we didn't have one yet I'll make a motion to approve okay I'll second we have a first and second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Aye. Okay. Anyone else abstain? Okay. Motion carries seven. Um, I'm sorry, six, one. Thank you. Thank you. Item 9.3 or SELPA local plan budget and service. Yes. Presented by Heather Gorman. Good evening, President Aserpa, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. Um, I here am here also to um, for approval of the local plan and the service plan for special services. I presented at the board meeting on June eighth, and today I am asking that you approve the budget and service plan. Any speakers? We have one speaker, Brandon Denise. Um, greetings to the board and thank you for allowing me to speak here today. Actually the first time speaking during summer break. So just letting you know that we're, PBFD isn't going anywhere. Um, I want to speak tonight on behalf of our fantastic and dedicated special education teachers and service personnel that we do have. Um, we often hear a lot about how special education encroaches upon the general education budget, but I want to remind you that special education issues are general education issues as well. Um, Especially identifying those students in the early years and we should really be investing more into our special ed students service personnel and teachers um, who are going to be the ones that are actually implementing the goals and the vision for the self is it going to be a centralized administration that's distanced to the classroom and not able to jump in and support when the kids need it? Is it going to be agency personnel who lack the overall skills of a credentialed teacher or service personnel? Um, or will it be the underpaid and underappreciated teachers who have been shouldering the burden for too long? So hopefully we can address some of those issues and have a great school year supporting our most vulnerable learners. Thank you. Thank you, Brandon. Okay, any questions um, or discussion from the board on the SELPA plan as presented last, last board meeting? Okay, I'd like to make a motion to approve this item. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstention? Okay, motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Next is item 9.4, approval of a universal PK plan. This is a report by Casey Clappenbach. 
I approve. Good evening once again, um, President De Serpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. So tonight, it is my pleasure to present our Universal PK Implementation Plan, and we'll also be asking for your approval later this evening. All right, so as we're thinking about it, right, we know that our state stole whole child, right, whole family, whole community from us, but these just show you how the themes um, state of investments, right? They really are focusing on the same thing and how the universal PK plan aligns with other monies. So you'll see how um, the ELOP is also connected to this too and other initiatives um, from the state. So as we're thinking about it, right, just like um, Trustee uh, Orozco was asking earlier, connecting that piece from PK to third so we can actually really support our students earlier and have that alignment with our preschools all the way up um, so we do have readers um, by third grade. And so as we were working on our plan, we had our guiding principles, and these are our five guiding principles, high expectations for all of our students. We want to make sure that our students have that developmentally informed um, environments, inclusive environments, right? And we're focusing on that language development and SEL along with academics. We have that 21st century, those learning environments for our youngest students, and they are developing their identity, belonging, and agency, and that connection to our whole family and whole community, right? That engagement piece and centering around our parents as our partners in education. And so as you're thinking about it, you probably hear UPK a lot, and you're thinking, what does that entail? Well, really, it is an umbrella for all of our preschool programs, right? And an effort to ensure our students and our families have access to early learning. So you can see it, en it encompasses our state preschool, which is CSPP when you see that, transitional um, kindergarten, um, and it goes all the way down to expanding learning options to support our students, giving them access for full day services, whether it's a full day TK or kindergarten model or an expanded learning opportunity in another way. So what is the UPK goal? It's really to provide more services for our younger students from three to four year olds statewide, giving them access to um, TK, right, which is early learning um, for all, and still giving them the options of all the other early, early learning programs out there. And then secondly, it is linked to legislature um, that really is part of that TK implementation plan, moving the birthday along. So in a few years, by 25, 26, um, the age for students to qualify for TK, they will be able to have just turned four years old. All right, as opposed to just about turning five. So it will gradually move that birth date you'll see in a little bit. So as we're thinking about that purpose, it's really about, as we know, early learning matters, right? The brain development that is going on during that time. And we know that our most vulnerable students, often whether it's low income, right? If it's um, an English learner, right? Um, don't always have the advantages, or even students with disabilities. And so this is really meant to clean up that gap. So as you're looking at the implementation timeline from the state, um, I do wanna highlight this is an implementation plan. So this year, um, we had a planning year, which will um, move us forward next year. Um, the only change, there are a couple changes I wanna highlight, it's birth date, will keep changing and allowing younger students to enter TK. And it also um, changes the ratio of adults to children. So this next year, the biggest change, those are the two changes. Again, the birth date changes. Um, and allows for students to, from the range to go from September 2nd through February 2nd to enter and qualify for TK, the transitional kindergarten, and it calls for providing for every 12 students another an additional adult 
in the classroom. And so you see that trend each year. It goes to the following year, 23-24, it will move to a ratio of one adult per 10 students. And then, of, and then you see that birth date change. And then we get to 25-26 and that full implementation piece. So districts are expected to be able to, based on student need, to um, give access throughout their district for TK um, classrooms. So there are five areas of focus. So my presentation will go through those five areas, right? Um, and you can see them all up here. And so as we're moving through this, our vision of coherence and bringing everything together is really providing a robust and inclusive and culturally responsive early childhood learning and learning program options. So the key word is options, right? Aligned with PK3, so that's third grade, focused on meeting the di diverse needs of, again, whole child, whole family, and whole community in which we serve, right? That's why we have our own plan. And so as you're looking at the different models, keep, keep each one of these in mind. Um, because they're, they are different. So the first one that we have that we can offer are TK offered at some sites with the, um, with the possibility of expanding to all. So the all means eventually as we're phasing in, you'll see it will be based on needs, right? Um, and the, as, we're, as we're moving along. Um, and so this would be offered at some and then grows as we're changing in age requirements, um, meeting the needs of our community. And then again, TK and kindergarten combination classes. So in some settings, we may have to have um, this setup, but we of course would have to be supporting them with that ratio, right? As it changes for a TK classroom. And then we will continue to have state preschool, but as we see on some sites, we may be able to in the future have a state preschool and a TK combination class. So this doesn't mean that they're in the same classroom together. This means that as students could be attending TK in the morning and state preschool in the afternoon if they're qualifying for that. So it isn't restrictive of those programs, meaning if they qualify for TK, it doesn't mean that they can't qualify for another program. Um, entity. And then we have our state preschool, which is CSPP standalone classes, which will continue. So we have students that qualify, parents prefer that, and we will continue to follow licensing and our procedures there. The same with our Head Start. We have a robust um, migrant seasonal Head Start and Head Start programs, which will also continue to meet the needs of the different um, populations of families that we have also. And then Again, we will also continue with our CSPP, our programs that are supported in family child care homes because sometimes that fits the need um, of our parents and families, right? Delivery models, again, just saying they will change as uh, based on enrollment projections and the needs at the sites as we expand. So as we're looking at current programs, you're going to see this next year, we are implementing our full day kindergarten pilot and we also have two sites that have that pilot for TK also. We will continue with our part day kindergarten programs too. And, um, and then if you're looking at it, look at the students that we're serving already in our, from our special services at Duncan Holbert to our migrant seasonal Head Start to our family child care homes to child development. Um, so we do have robust systems that some districts do not have already in place. And then we will continue to, um, to make sure students have opportunities of inclusion and mainstream opportunities to so as we're looking at this right now, currently we are good because we have we are already we have been providing access to at least nine um, TK sites throughout our district, um, and as we've actually in the past. Um, had low enrollment in some of them, and we have been working to to really um, gain. Um, attendance in those and enrollment. Um, as we're looking at 23-24, based on 
on um, in, um, past enrollment and numbers we've been given from the state and just requests for TK. Um, we have two sites that would be possibly expanding to, and again, it's based on um, need at that time. So we will be looking at that every year as we're as we're moving forward, and then again as need. Um, as need persists and, and dictates, we will also be adding on three additional sites. And then if, again, in need, as the birth date is changing and younger students we want to give access to, um, we would be expanding out. All right, so that would be by 2526. And so again, those are just the factors that are continuously being taken into consideration too. As we're looking at our um, early childhood educators, they, are, they attend and are part of a lot of community leadership programs and networks out there. So they're always collaborating and working with them. And so these are just a few of the ones that they are part of. And then it is a consorted effort, right, of our departments that are looking at needs. And so we have had an early learning team with multiple departments for the last few years that have been working together. Um, again, seeing if we can align those early indicators so our kids are more ready for kindergarten and first grade and they have that early advantage. Next year we will be partnering and adding, um, we've been partnering with them at the end of this year, but continuing with the stronger partnerships with EL programs and family engagement. So how have we so far engaged with our community? We um, partners to get um, information for this implementation plan. I don't know why it's connecting to Zoom, but we have we have conducted staff surveys. We have also need surveys that our early childhood um, programs have been giving out for years, seeing what our four-year-olds, our parents of four-year-olds are asking for and their needs are. Um, and so there we've we have our early learning collaborative, um, which Dr. Rodriguez leads to, and we speak with them across the way. And then we have other surveys um, that we hand out at different times with our programs also. And then as we're looking at how will we continue, because we always want to get better. So as we're expanding to other school sites, our goal is to be able to increase our ECE and, and Migrant Seasonal Head Start parent meetings talking about this. So we really want, they really understand um, at, an, at, an, at that time um, where, what offerings we have, especially for TK, right? And the different language programs and the things that will meet their needs. We also also, we'll be having UPK parent meetings at designated sites. So you saw that we had that timeline. We're going to be meeting with parents at those upcoming sites this next year. So we have moving data, right? So we have more accurate um, data moving along. And then especially coming back from the pandemic, right? A lot of our parents have kept their kids home out of some of our early childhood programs. And then of course, we wanna also have those meetings at sites and support principals at their ELAC meetings. We also want to um, expand our collaboration with uh, Monterey County Child Development Programs and First Five. We have that partnership um, in Santa Cruz right now. So what do our families value most? So at a glimpse, really, the need that we, we saw when we um, asked our parents that were going into TK or kindergarten, 83% of the families have a need for a full day program out of the ones that we surveyed. And so 75% of them felt that it was important for it to be close to their home neighborhood school, right? And then 90% felt it was important for them to have maintained social relationships, right? So you'll see that's a focus of ours too. And then 15% of parents noted that their child um, either had an IEP already or they were getting some sort of um, early support. 
Okay, so that also helps us to plan ahead also because we know that early support makes the difference. And then you will keep hearing blending and braiding of programs, right, and funding sources. And so we're going to give you a couple examples of this. So one example might be if the conditions are right and we have a specific program like that state preschool, we might um, on a campus. So I'm going to use Calabasas for example, right? They have a TK at their, pro, at their school already. They could have TK in the morning and for students who qualify and are eligible, they could have state preschool in the PM to support those needs. So that's one area where we're, where we're able to meet it in, a, in an innovative fashion. And then this might be a different one as we're blending and, and working with um, our ELOP plan and, and team. This might be a different option, right? So eventually when we have that before, before school care, you uh, parents might be able to have that support in the morning before school, then they go to their full day kindergarten instructional day, and then they have an ELOP funded extended learning program in the afternoon. So that would be uh, that those extended that extended day for them and those hours. So these are just some of the possibilities and you will hear a little bit later about the ELOP efforts. But again, this part of our plan is in alignment. So when that it will um, have those pieces and be aligned together. And so again, you saw some of those opportunities to give that extended nine hour day to our students. Um, and as we're looking at some of the possibilities one might be to make sure that overlap time that our students are being cared for if they don't have a full day kindergarten program, that they would have that ELOP time, right, um, from additional instructional assistance or support staff until the after school program um, started if they were in AM kindergarten. And then our full day kindergarten, they would just follow our first grade through fifth or sixth grade expanded learning opportunities. And then again, all of our sites will get all of our support staff as the birth dates are changing, will continue to get professional development, making sure that they are equipped to work with our, our youngest students. So as we are working with recruitment, right, we know that we need to recruit the staff because requirements are changing, right, and we are expanding services for our families. So we, this is also one of those um, pieces where it's connected to another grant that we applied for. We applied for an early educator teacher development grant to help support those pathways. Um, and if we get it, it may provide up to 600,000 additional dollars for us. Um, at the most, and so we have reached out and we have confirmed partnerships with CSUMB, Cabrillo College, and San Jose State in different ways, but um, to support building that pathway or pipeline to support um, growing our staff. So for instance, Cabrillo College, really we want to make sure that we are helping our IAs who may need, who may want to become an early childhood teacher, right, a TK teacher, um, to really move up and maybe get their, their teaching credential. It may also be able to support getting them their ECE units or additional teachers that don't have those ECE e units as we're expanding TK because there will be a requirement um, of 24 ECE units um, for teachers to be having the the um, the four-year-olds in their in their classes. And so we also, um, as we're looking at that, we surveyed our early childhood educators, our ECE and Migrant Seasonal Head Start departments, and really to look at where they come in with their education. So this is just a quick glimpse that we do have 64% current ECE staff. They have an AA already or a higher degree. We also have 30% of our ECE teachers who would like to pursue a teaching credential. So that's really important too, because we can help um, fund some of some of their education and completion through this grant and the or this planning piece, and then if we get the other grant too. And so we want to also make sure we continue to increase regular staff needs assessment. But then we looked and we saw the overall barrier for a higher level degree or credential was financial. So this might be a great way to bring up. Um, our own, right? 
And so as we're developing our workforce, we also, thanks to um, Julie Edwards, our coordinator of CTE, right? She has been working. Um, we know that we have our Watsonville High School on the right, that education academy, and really want to build in um, the, the, the opportunities for our students to be able to get the, the, the dual opportunities and college um, credit um, for those courses right as they're taking them as high school students and then on the left you'll also see that she is working on maximizing and, ex and expanding a another grant with um, and a pathway to Cabrillo to make sure to enable our students to actually do the work for in high school in our classrooms and get paid for it right and to also be able to get them units for not only high school school and college which would be really great and so they can be in in college and they go off to college and they have a job with us and they're getting credit for it and getting paid which is really phenomenal because we're again we're built we're growing our own and empowering our community and then these are just uh, um a, a few of really um, the professional learning that we will be offering and supporting as we're building out and expanding, right? Because we're going to have younger students in our classrooms too. And that alignment, again, with the pre-K-3. Um, and one thing I would like to call out is that the implicit bias training does go on in our early learning programs. And so it will continue as we are um, supporting our, our teachers and that professional development. We also will continue with our SEL, as you saw that was important for our parents, and really highlighting creating developmentally informed environments, right? Because we know that a four-year-old is way different than a student that's about to turn five. Right, that year is important. And then again, how will we offer professional learning? And job embedded coaching, mentoring. Um, we will continue with our TK collaborative meetings and partnerships. And then again, the um, maximizing and collaborating between our elementary PD and some of our um, early learning also in mixed groups. So our language models, as we expand into TK, we do want to make sure that we are providing opportunities for multilingual dual um, programs. And so as we expand, we will be vertically aligned with with um, our English learner programs at the elementary schools. So as we expand to a school that has a, a bilingual or a dual program, the TK will be a dual program that we offer. Okay. And so they have that continuum. We will also continue. We do have programs right now that will continue to offer the English only with home language support. This is what we have. And then structured English um, immersion. And so as we continue to develop, we will align with it um, at the earliest levels too. As we're talking about curriculum, instruction, and assessment, assessment does look a little bit different when we're thinking about an instruction at those lowest levels. So our TK class, or earliest levels, um, does they are informed not by standards, but by the California Preschool Foundations and Framework, which is currently being updated. So. Um, some of this plan will be updated along with that framework, and we will be working with a with a team of um, our TK teachers and ECE to analyze developmentally appropriate assessments because we will have to be using them for the whole child in our early ages, just like our ECE programs. And then we want to make sure that we have in, uh, um, ensure alignment that all of our programs, right, have those same metrics that we can look at and improve upon and meet the needs of our community better. So just a range of how we will continue to support is we have mental health clinicians in our ECE and Migrant Seasonal Head Start programs. Some of that we can also combine and support our TK classes at the same time. We will also continue to focus on our, um, our teaching pyramid, which is um, used at the earliest levels. 
And then our next one is, as we're building our facilities, um, services, and operations, we have to make sure that we have the facilities and classrooms. So right now, we have things that we're looking at. Um, we are focusing on this um, currently with our master plan, which is being updated and included. Um, we will also continue to look at that declining enrollment, which is opening up space for our students, right? Um, and then ensuring classrooms follow ed code requirements. We're making sure that they have the right space, they're close to the restrooms, and meeting all of those. And then uh, something we are proud of is our TK students are already given transportation to, um, to their sites if they need it. And then also, so as we're looking at our, our planning budget, this is a planning budget to help us start with that implementation and continue some of these areas that we need to get into place as we expand. So the total funding piece is $330. $1,435, and you can see it is allocated in those, in those areas to um, really get us uh, moving forward. Um, as you can see, we do have that piece of that in the middle, that recruitment piece of um, fifty thousand dollars. That is there to that may um, increase or decrease based on us getting the other grant, the EE um, TD grant. And then what you may be wondering, right? Um, while participation in UPK and choice of which program is optional, TK is the only option which is um, within the broader UPK framework that will be universal, right? So this one is at no cost to our parents. We are, um, we are rolling it out so all of the uh, eligible students have it, but parents still have that choice. Right? So we're not, if a parent would rather have them participate in state preschool, they still have that option. If Migrant Seasonal Head Start is, is meeting their needs at that age requirement, then that, then that also is fine. Or if TK does, then it's accessible to them also. And then what does this mean this upcoming year for our families? It's a continuation of services for things we are already providing. So we're not going to stop some parents maybe asking, oh, or, uh, do I have to go to TK? Do I have to? No. If you're in another program, that is still your option for your students, for your student. And then the expansion, of course, um, of the school day. Right, we know that with the ELOP that will be coming up, which will be presented later, that we have offerings for days, and then we also have full day and full day TK and kindergarten pilots going on this year. And then the last one is that birth date, right? So we are going to make sure that our parents know that as that birth date timeline changes, right? It opens up and we will be expanding um, sites based on need. So now it's time for questions. Are there any speakers to this item? We have one speaker, Chris Webb. Okay, just give me like a 30 second cue. Yeah. Um, I just want to say I fully support this item and I, I just wish it come sooner um, because it's I have a four-year-old who just turned four this month and it seems like he's not going to be able to enjoy PVSD PVSD TK next year and that's disappointing not just because PVSD has a lot to offer but because he's still going to go to TK anyway it's just going to be in another district that I, I'm less happy with um, and, and knowing that, it seems to me like it's less about the state law and more about, may, maybe it's just the capacity issues here or something or some policy thing, but, but it's, it's a little disappointing for me because I'd want him to be able to come here. And I, I am hearing all the enrollment, low enrollment things and I'm feeling like we're missing out. Um, and also that, that kind of thing of where we're, like I, I like to see PBSD lead state law sometimes, 
Um, I understand if it's like a funding thing, but like I think of how like at my site at Renaissance we had feminine hygiene products out in the bathrooms before the law required it. I like to see PVSD leading in that way. And also, um, I just want to say, yeah, I'm that parent who would want full day. And also, I would want value um, building and maintaining social relationships and bilingual education also. And also, um, kind of going back to earlier in the year where we had like teachers with child care issues. I, have 30 I, seconds. I see that part about the, um, the Watsonville High School and you know using that to develop um, teachers in-house. I feel like that'd be a perfect complement to uh, helping staff with their child care needs, um, especially if we're not going to do alternative measures to deal with that issue. Also, I appreciate the implicit bias training within this uh, pro program, and I got that at San Jose State, and I feel like it's very valuable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any questions or comments from the board? Um, so, I'm sorry if I missed it. That was a very long presentation because it was super, there's a lot to say about this topic. So PK starts when? So PK has started already because we have preschool. So PK just stands for the preschools PK. we already have, right? Yes. Oh, okay. I thought so, it was maybe some, well, you said yeah. something about four year olds will be eligible. Yeah. So the PK is really expanding. It's that umbrella, right? So it's the TK that's actually expanding. So the birthday is changing, but the PK is all, it's like a overall umbrella for all those early learning programs. So four-year-olds for four. Four year olds and up can now be in TK. Sorry, it's confusing to me. I'm sure it's confusing to the public. I'll turn it back. Okay. Um, actually, go back to slide number eight. The blue slide that has the dates. So that she can see it right there. There we are. There you go. See, it changes. So next year, it's September 2nd to February 2nd. They have to turn five between September 2nd and February 2nd. And then each year it grows. Okay. And it goes to April 2nd, then June 2nd. So we have to follow this calendar. We don't get ADA. Unless we, we do. I so, see. Okay. Yeah, so for fiscal reasons, because the ratio is mm -hmm. 1 to 12 or 1 to 10, we wouldn't. Um, do students that mm -hmm. are not within this range okay. because fiscally it wouldn't make sense for us to do so. So when we talk about expanding our curricula to our preschools, setting this aside, setting the TK expansion aside to all the preschools that we have running in the district, including the family home care programs? Are we expanding new curriculum in those areas then? So we will be looking at it. Right now we do have creative curriculum and it is aligned with our ECE program and our Migrant Seasonal Head Start. And why we utilize it because it goes all the way down. We actually have toddlers and two-year-olds and one-year-olds that actually it, it hits the whole gamut. And it's one of the best that's out there. So we try to align it with our home child care providers also. That's great. Thank you. Can you. Just to be back on that question, can you expand a little bit on the alignment of metrics? Yes, I would love to. So right now we have been working um, with the DRDP, which is a developmental test that's looking at the whole child and where they are in our early learning programs. And so our early learning team has actually picked key metrics to be able to look at. So they have an early learning metric that they're looking at to see gaps and how, how good our students are, how well they're doing, and then where do we need to enhance our program. They also have a numeracy one that we're looking at. Um, and then we also have a social emotional piece and we're just taking a piece of those um, of the DRD, DRDP because it is a very comprehensive assessment and so that's how, how we're trying to align those measures so it feeds into what we're working on also at TK and kindergarten. Okay, so when we identify through those metrics areas of growth within the child are we also then following up with additional supports in those areas? 
so um, right now, as we're looking at, as a team, it is a very new thing the last two years where we're trying to really look at the most important things that matter. Our ECE programs are able to do that now. They actually use it to be able to provide um, informed instruction. They also have coaching um, from um, their mental health clinicians and other supports for those environments that are developmentally appropriate and next steps for teachers. Okay. So as far as um, TK, so we have students who um, either are receiving special education services through SARC or other agencies who then are referred to Duncan Holbert for an assessment. And from there, they either determined that the child remains a Duncan Holbert or that they would do well in a less restrictive environment. So when that transition happens, and we're looking at expanding TK, then those special education services would also transfer to the classroom. Is that correct? Yes. So there's, okay. So I just yep. want to make sure that that's also being aligned. Um, and I'm assuming the same goes for uh, services received by a child through our ECE programs. Yes. Okay. Well, this is exciting. I've been asking for this for such a long time, I feel. Uh, so it's nice to see that we're finally uh, moving in the direction of aligning our program so that we really focus on, um, on uh, helping students you know, at the, the earlier age. Um, and so as we go through this transition and this implementation, is there's also, um, uh, room for us to begin thinking about or collaborating with community partners for um, um, a cradle to college and career support program in, in the future? So yes, so we are, um, so statewide there are 13 what they call surf regions that are formulating a PTK through 20 consortium. Um, we are currently one of the only K-12 districts that is on the consortium for our surf area. Our surf area actually starts in Santa Cruz County and goes all the way down to Santa Barbara. Um, so we were just on a two-hour call today, and that will provide us millions of dollars in order to be able to do the Cradle to Career Initiative. That's amazing to yeah. hear. And because each surf, each of the 13 surfs are guaranteed the money, um, because we are part of that collaboration, and I actually, we need to get other K-12s on there, um, but currently we're the one that they've been reaching out to. And um, so we're guaranteed that money, and so we'll be able to for sure do the Cradle to Career and have it sustained for at least five years through that surf funding. Great. Yeah. So the answer is yes, yes, and yes. We're ahead of the curve. Thank you. So I would like to um, request approval of our UPK implementation plan. I would like to make a motion to approve the item. That's great. I'll I'll second. Second. You'll second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Thank you. Motion passes unanimously. Thank you. That was a great presentation, Casey. I believe we moved up an item, which is item 9.13. I'd also move, I, this is, I, this is sort of unprecedented, but I'd also like to make a motion to move 9.12 up after 9.13, because I know we have people here who have been waiting to speak to that. So I'm, I'll make a motion if I can have a second. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. 
Okay, item 9.13, the painting of murals at Renaissance High School. All right, thank you. Good evening, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, this evening, I'm here to um, ask for approval for the murals, uh, the painting of the murals at Renaissance High School. Uh, with their Measure L funds, uh, Renaissance High School is due for an upgrade in their painting. Um, as some people are aware, that when you live by the sea, the salt in the air does damage to paint and to um, structures. And so because of this, uh, the, the, it is, the school is overdue for a painting um, job. While the contractors were out there for the bidding, um, they noted that originally the murals were not in the plan, and they noted that if the murals remain on the walls, um, that the murals themselves with the peeling would damage the walls um, behind it if um, painting was not done. There are currently eight murals um, at Renaissance High School that are involved within the painting project. Five are removable and three are non-removable. And so um, on, the, on this website, um, and what took place is that the pieces and the project was placed on the website for um, public information to find if we could locate any of the original artists so that they can work with the um, murals and as of this date um, no artists have come forward. So what we're looking at here um, is that on the top left that is on that is a non-removable mural which means it's painted directly on the wall that's behind classrooms seven and eight so that's one of the murals that would be painted over the next two under that are removable murals which means that they would actually come off and then the murals will be restored they'll be placed and then those murals will be placed back on the wall once the painting is done the um, mu the mural on the bottom left hand side is out Outside um, the restroom by room two. This is also on the wall, so this is one of the ones that will be painted over. Um, and then the last one that would be painted over that is non-removable is the one in the center on the bottom, the under the water theme. This is um, also on the wall, which would be painted over. The mural up on the right hand top side is actually not going to be touched. And then the next three are all removable murals that will be taken off, restored, and then placed back on um, the wall when it is completed. And so um, if any of the artists come forward in the future, um, the school site and the district will work with the artists to restore the original murals, whether um, and work with them, whether it's on the removable or the non-removable sides. And with that, staff is asking for approval to move forward with the painting at the campus at Renaissance High School um, and working with the murals. Are there any speakers? Yes, we have three speakers to this item. We have Chris Webb, followed by Jen Laskin, and Graciela Vega. Uh, as a Renaissance teacher, I had inquired about this issue um, earlier in the year, and and I kind of got like, oh, we're, we've documented them; it's it's handled. But then, I, in the, this on Friday, when I saw the agenda, and I, I saw like, oh, well, we put out a notice on the website, and we sent out synergy emails. I was I was real troubled by that because I feel like people should know our community and like that's not the way to to reach out and and it makes me wonder why it was done in that way um, so I, I have reached out and and I have some information about these but um, that I was real concerned about that because I saw what happened with Watsonville and I didn't want to see the same thing um, happen to Renaissance and um, I think that we're missing a real opportunity to to really include the students. And I, I'm not sure if there is a, a full appreciation for just the level of building of community that these murals have brought. And I say this as somebody who wasn't even around when these are first brought, but I know the students appreciate them. I know they mean a lot to a lot of people. And they were by students, for students. Um, I'm gonna flip to, if I can, to who did some of them. I know the one on, Room two, which can't be, the, which is to do to be painted over, literally whitewashed because I saw the paint now is going to be white. Um, it was by Victor Carrillo. This would be the one outside room two, um, and let me see. Um, 
Um, another one, the painter of the woman mural is by Jose Sanchez, graduated from Renaissance High School in late 90s, early 2000s. He works as a car painter and does airbrush work. Um, that was brought to me by Graciela Vega. For Jennifer Laskin, my name is Jennifer Laskin. I was a teacher at Renaissance High School from 2003 to 2012. Teaching at Renaissance was one of the best experiences of my entire career. I miss it every day. I was one of the organizers of the mur mural set for removal restoration. We worked with several students after school. We did the mural with the pyramid, the dragon, is a school mascot and the many hands making the circle of peace. We used the students themselves to trace their hands for that mural. We worked with Santa Cruz artist Elijah Fotenhauer, P F O T E N H A U. E -R, he, who was the main artist on the project. The mural was a symbol for our collective efforts, peaceful intentions, and love of culture with the beautiful pyramid. I sincerely hope that now you know the history and the name of the original artist. The school administration and school board leadership will ensure the mural is preserved, renovated, and replaced after the painting of the school is complete. Thank you for your time, Jen Laskin. I thought Jen Laskin was gonna be here in person. Chris, yeah, that's what I thought. I thought, I didn't see her here earlier. Um, well, I, I appreciate Jen's um, weighing in on the matter. I think in the future, Chris, though, we're going to need to not read people's cards that aren't actually present. <laughs> but thank you, Jen, for weighing in. Um, okay, who's next? And, um, Graciela Vega. Graciela, for the first uh, minute, I'm gonna time you on my phone and then I'm gonna start that one after, okay? So it's two minutes? It's two minutes. Okay, I'm gonna take a deep breath. Can we not time me when I take a deep breath, please? Because I'm gonna take three, two, three restorative breaths. And you can take it with me, compañeros, because you've been sitting there a long time and it gets <laughs> oxygen to our brain. I just want to ground myself. Okay. Um, so my name is Graciela Vega. I'm coming here as a community member. And, um, you know, I'm also an artist with Pajaro Valley Arts Council. And um, a multicultural artist here in the community. So if you have something for Dia de los Muertos, I, I will be curating that show. Please submit. Um, so top left, Elijah Fautenhauer. Um, that was a collaborative effort. Um, that was part of social emotional. So if you're seeing, we're, we're, we're all about social emotional. And the city of Watsonville just passed a, a, a proposal to send monies to the residents of Watsonville through the arts. And that thing happened last month. So all of this artwork is a form of engaging the students in social emotional. Um, the one at the bottom is a really tiny mural. That's Elijah. The one with the dragon, um, that was a collective effort from our students to restore that mural. The one on the bottom, one of our students passed away. Um, so that was to bring the community together and to mourn the student. So I don't know how we could redo that. Um, Santos is the one in the middle um, because the Renaissance is so close to the ocean. We had eco stewards that were caring for the environment and so we received a grant and so Santos did that mural. So that was with grant money. Once again, Elijah was done. Jose Sanchez was already mentioned. Um, so, you know, I come here because I have memory, historical memory, like um, as being a community member here in Watsonville. Um, if you have any questions, um, you can talk to me later on. I'm teaching kinder right now for extended learning, so anyways. Um, Thank you, Graciela. I hope this helps solve the puzzle. Yeah. Definitely. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Um, Jen Shocker, do you have a question? Is it she chat? Is she putting it in the chat, or is she going to say it out loud? Oh, she's she's, she's going to say it okay. out loud. Yeah. She's on the way. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. Sorry, I know we're having some little sound issues. Um, in light of what was brought forth. Um, at this meeting, I think that we need to rethink a plan of what is going to happen with these murals um, and get in touch with these artists and students and have a plan in place to repaint or do something um, honoring them in a different area or once the interior or exterior is painted, uh, make a plan to repaint. I'm not comfortable um, moving forward without contacting some of the students that and artists that worked on these murals. So it is the three murals that are permanent and with the information, if we can, with uh, the principal now on uh, summer break, um, we can work, both Clint Rucker and I will work to contact the artist to um, move forward with it. Because as stated, if, the, if we found out who the artists were, that we would work with them to make sure that we are honoring the work and the history at, at Renaissance. Okay, any other? Um, questions or discussion from the board? I think um, if we are going to be reaching out to the artists, which we should, um, I would want to reach out to them first before this process begins. So we can do that. Okay. That would be great. Thank you. Trustee Dodge Jr. So what I'm hearing this evening was you're trying some some of the people that are here, I know Graciela does work and she's having an event about art right here at the Art Center. Um, so what I'm hearing is to wait before going over some of these murals? Is, is that what I'm hearing from the public? I think within our the, the board policy, what we do is that we do have to work with the school sites, reach out to the original artists of the murals. Before we had come this evening, and thank you community members who um, are now we have the information available to the, reach out to the artists, we didn't have any information as to who the artists were and who we would um, contact to try to get it on. The, um, and so with that, we will contact the artists before we move forward. What I would ask is just for the board to provide direction and approval to remove the removable ones that are not are not going to be damaged. They're going to be removed so that then we can paint over that location. And then we will then on the three that are non-removable um, is the ones that will move will work on that piece. Um, but I, I don't, I hate to put them on the spot because I'm not sure, I don't know. Hurley, do you know the timeline of when this is supposed to start? Herlindo, do you know, or Clint? Yeah, I can respond to that. Um, the, so the painter's already out there working on areas that are not the murals at the moment. Um, this, again, it's because it's a full painting project of the entire site. needs to be done during summertime because it can't be done, obviously, while students are present with them spraying and the way that they're painting. Um, we did, as uh, Lisa mentioned, reach out to the painting contractors and asked, would we be able to just leave the murals up and not paint them? And they said that they could leave them up, but they do believe there will be damage to the walls behind them, and that continued damage will continue to occur because you can't simply just put a coat on them to protect them. You would need to actually repaint the mural. So they recommended to us to repaint them, to paint over them, and then have the original artist, if available, repaint the mural. So. So, um, so Jen Chakar, because of the tech issue, she's been texting me, so if people wonder why I'm on my phone, it's because of that. Um, but she said that she would like to amend the item to not paint over the, per the permanent murals. 
Um, so I'm reading that text. That, that, that is her, her request. Um, Trustee Holm. So in talking about the damage, if it's not painted, like what are we talking about? Like what, what would happen to the walls if we didn't do the restoration that is recommended? So some of those murals already have a little bit of damage just from paint, of course, as it chips away. Um, the contractor mentioned that you could just have damage to the walls, such as, again, in the sea weather, you end up getting water in the walls, you get it in the wood, starts to rot away the actual interior of the wall. So that's, again, when you paint any wall, you're actually protecting the innards of that wall as well, not just putting a nice coat of paint for looks. So again, this wasn't necessarily, uh, their, their painting project wasn't just to make the school look nicer, which of course is always a benefit. It was also to protect the structures of the building. So um, I, we, I don't know that we would be able to identify exactly what the damage would be if we didn't paint over them. Um, this was the recommendation from the contractor. We could absolutely check in with him and ask if he has an estimate. I don't know if it's available without trying to Again, somehow get behind the wall and look at if there's damage already. And for, um, like if, you know, as a board, we determine that we need to you know, maintain the structure of our, our buildings and we look where contact the artists in order to either redo or, or can we set it up so that they are removable so we don't have this problem in the future? Is that an option? Yes, I think that's a good idea that we could look into. So is, would it be possible for tonight for the board just to approve the ones that are removable and then that we can place back on? Yes, they, so they are removable or they come off and they'll be stored in a location and, um, and then they'll be placed back on, yeah. So could we vote on that tonight? And then we will meet with the um, artists artist and then come back with the plan for the ones that are permanent on the wall. Yes, can we do that tonight? Are we, since the contractor is out there, are we able to do that? So I just want to make sure that we guys have all the full information because I would assume if, if they're out there with the crew, I'm not saying it's a wrong decision, I just want us to know. If they're out there with the crew, then it's probably better to either say tape it up and do, do everything but those three locations and we'll, whatever happens to the walls happen. Or, um, cause if we come back in July, remember we don't have a meeting for a month, then that means likely they wouldn't, they would have to come back. So they have all their crew and supplies out there. So likely that wouldn't happen without a change order, I would assume. So I, I'm, I mean, it's fine if that's what we want to do, cause it costs us additional money to also restore murals. I know we did it, especially with the one at Watsonville High because of just the, the, the significance of that, um, but it was not, not costly. It, it was a costly um, restoration. And so I just want to you know, make sure that you guys are making the decision with full information, that it, they, they would be a change order. They're not just going to leave and then come back um, for free. President Trustee. Oh, Trustee Acosta. Um, so, and I just wanted to clarify, these are all exterior walls. Yes, correct. So it is possible to have, and I absolutely agree with um, Dr. Rodriguez, and I saw Clint, you were shaking your head yes to what she was saying. It will most likely include a change order, which will, will be an accrued cost, additional cost to this district to have a paint crew come back. But they are exterior walls, so we shouldn't see too much disruption to st student life if the students should start up in August, would we? It depends on the equipment that's being used for the painting. And I was, I haven't visited the site to see what, if it's, it's full spraying or. Okay. So if we voted no on this tonight, the painting would still happen, the murals would be preserved for now until another plan was 
put into place, correct? If you vote no tonight, then any of the walls that have removable and non-removable murals will not be touched. So why can't you remove the murals? You that are removable. Because you need to amend the motion and vote yes. Oh, uh, we do? I think that's what she said. Yeah. That doesn't make any, yes. well, she did, but I, I didn't understand why we were doing that. Why can't we just move the murals so that we could paint behind them? Because part of the new board policy is you would have to approve that. So we would have to ask you, which is what my request was, and it was also Jennifer Shocker's request, is to allow us to um, at least remove the removable ones so that we could paint where the removable was. And then okay, I, gotcha. I, for me, the three, I would either rather, I'd rather you either say, tape it up and paint around it um, and just get the whole thing done um, so that then we don't have a change order or work with the artist and then decide what the decision is. But and it's three that are not removable? Three That's are removable It's the top left, the uh, one in the middle on the bottom, and then the other one is the bottom left. So top left, bottom left, and then the one in the middle. Wait, top left? Top left, bottom left, bottom. and then the one in the middle, the bottom middle. So I'm gonna recommend to the board that we do what Dr. Rodriguez said, is tape them up and paint around them. In terms of murals, since uh, I, I know something about them because I led a mural program at Valencia with um, Guillermo Aranda. So he put a bunch of murals up with the kids. So those murals, if they need to be repainted, can be restored. Um, and the cost, I think, for Guillermo Aranda to do it was his time, really, was probably the most expensive thing. And I'm sure the paint was too. But um, the Arts Council has money that could probably, we could write grants to get some money to help with this. Um, but then also we could put a clear coat over them too to help protect the wall behind. There's many ways that we could do this. So I think tonight we should continue with the painting but protecting the murals that are in place and removing the, the murals that can be removed and painting behind. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay, so that's my motion. If that's clear enough. So is that your motion or Shelby's? <laughs> well, she made one amendment and then I added to it, so okay. I don't know. I, resident um, Trustee Minister, but the one thing I'd also like to add is something that uh, Trustee Holm mentioned, and I think it's great. And I don't know that this is the place to put that. But the suggestion that going forward, any murals, including when these are put back or anywhere, that they be removable murals going forward. So maybe we need to amend that item about where it was brought to be brought to the board, Obviously. maybe make a new policy at a soon upcoming future board meeting that all murals, um, whether they're replaced or you know being put back or new, that they be removable. So this board and other boards going forward in the future are not in this predicament. As well as the community, it's it's not just us; it's the community because it's 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 affecting clearly community members who have concerns over it. Okay. So I think we've gotten word from Jen Shocker that she's approving the motion that I made, which I don't know if it's clear enough. Do you want me to say it again? It, it is clear. It okay. is we are going to move. We are going to cover up the non-removable mirrors, paint, murals, paint around them, and the removable murals. We'll take them off carefully, and place them aside. Paint those walls, and then place them back. Okay. Yeah. I need a second. I'll second. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed or abstaining? I vote yes. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and next up is item 9.12, approve the mural at Freedom Elementary. All right, good evening once again. President De Serpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. 
Um, so tonight our team is requesting an approval for the mural at Freedom Elementary and I have three gentlemen here who will um, describe the mural and give you a little background and we have Mr. Gerardo uh, Morales, the principal at Freedom Elementary. We have Mr. Tom House and we also have Kyle um, Goder. President just served by the board and Dr. Rodriguez. My first time I get to come up here at 10 o'clock at night. It's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> but I inherited this project at our, uh, at, our, at our site and at first it was like, whoa, and then now I'm really, after now that we get to enjoy the field with our students, it's been such a, a blessing to have one of the nicest fields in the district. And um, But with it came also an opportunity to enhance our school with the beautiful mural uh, you know, acknowledging the hard work of that field and what it represents. And so we have two gentlemen here who are going to continue to give us a little more information on it who are much more in debt in the process than I was. I just got on, so I'll let them speak. Sure. Hi, I'm Tom House. Um, I got involved with this by being in the Watsonville Rotary Club, which um, spawned the uh, Pajaro Valley Sports Foundation. This is our first project. Um, this whole idea of a mural came up because there was a graffitied wall on Dr. Suzuki's office that um, showed up from everywhere in the field, and we thought, well, why don't we put a mural on that and get rid of the graffiti and maintain it, and that'll enhance the whole area. And we got the mural all together and to send it to Dr. Suzuki who is about to retire and wants to sell his building and he said I don't think I want to put a mural on it might wreck my sale so uh, we approached the school to see if they would like to put the mural on uh, a portable classroom building right next to the field right in the corner by where you enter the parking lot for the field brand new 48 space parking lot that we uh, put in and um, so we thought we could shrink the mural down to half its size and put it on that building to uh, beautify the field. And uh, Kyle Kotler, also a uh, Rotary member, has been dealing with the artist, Brittany uh, Costanzo, to do that. And um, our plan is we have a 10-year lease with a 10-year option, which we plan to exercise. <laughs> our plan is to put it on there and to maintain it, to put an anti-graffiti coating over the top of it, and as needed to update the mural to keep it in good shape throughout our tenure. Um, and if the building has to go away, well, the mural's gonna have to go with it. We, we have a deal with the artists. If the mural needs to go, it will go. So Kyle, did you wanna say anything? Sure. Um, yeah, so I've been working probably about a year now with um, local artist Brittany Costanzo. Um, she's an Aptos High School alumni and a CSUMB um, student as well. And she had come up with, I don't know, probably a dozen different renditions over the past year um, between the two buildings that we've looked at. This is the most recent one that we're looking at. And um, what the, the main project for this field is to, to benefit the Aztecas Soccer Club and the PV United Soccer Club. So um, we also had large donations from Driscoll. So that's kind of the main uh, vision of the field is the the kind of the um, we wanted to give recognition to the Driscoll's employees that made these donations in the history of Driscoll's and then also give some credit to the PV United and Azteca soccer um, clubs that will be using the fields for the most part as well as the students at Freedom Elementary and um, that's that's about the most of it I think you know it, it's gonna be a, a nice a nice mural when all and done I believe she'll be doing a you know a primer base coat on the building as well as a graffiti coat um, and you know the the soccer field and the teams will be kind of maintaining the longevity of the of the project one other note yeah. if you look in the bottom left hand corner you have the district logo down there too <laughs> did you see me did you hear me just ask about that yeah thank you it they look, looks it. great yeah, we, <laughs> we love it um do we have any speakers no speakers so it's like okay any comments or discussion questions from the board it's beautiful <laughs> trustee dodge jr I would just like to say thank you, Mr. Health. I know it's been a couple years. Um, you along with you know, Mr. Skinner, Gina Casineda, Jennifer Ning, and Uriel Mendoza, all this didn't happen overnight. You know, it's been years. You know, you guys got out there with tools. You know, the community came together. Someone bought a backhoe and PVC pipes, and it's. It's a beautiful place, but it came with a lot of hard work, a lot of time, and I just wanted to say thank you for the community, the Rotary, 
um, just the volunteers, you know, there was, I was there a couple times in the mornings on Saturdays and you guys had coffee and food and everybody was ready to go to work and tear up that field and they put it together. So I just wanted to say thank you. And if you need to fix another field, we have Mini White and Radcliffe if you're looking to fix up any other field. So thank you. We would like to do more, but we want to get this one finished. We still have to put in a scoreboard and some nets so the balls, when we play sideways with the youth teams, don't go over into the mobile home parks. And we may be coming back to you on that to get approval to amendment of the lease to allow the scoreboard. So. Well, this is just great. We really appreciate the community involvement from the Rotary Club. We can't we can't do it without our community partners, and we really appreciate your interest in Freedom mm -hmm. Elementary School. So, I'd like to make a motion to approve this mural. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? I vote yes. Great. Thanks, Jen. <laughs> Okay, thank you, and thank you for waiting. I'm sorry I didn't I, I didn't realize you guys were all here waiting, but um, I'm sure it was a very interesting meeting for you tonight. <laughs> I have a two and four year old, so I was, I was taking notes on the Yeah, okay. <laughs> they got a little concerned about the mural part from before, right? so they got a little hesitant here. But no, Blank, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. It. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. President to serve a point of order, I'd like to move to extend our meeting till midnight. That's great. Thank you. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Aye. Okay. We have <coughs> everyone in agreement and Trustee Acosta opposed. Um, I lost my place now. I don't know where I am. 9.7. 9.7. Um, no, we're on 9.5. I'm sorry. Right, yes. I knew it. Yeah. Okay, 9.5, Expanded Learning Opportunity Plan. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. So we are going to have another presentation of a wonderful plan. So we have, um, we had a, a committee worth of 20 employees, um, 20 staff members who came to support this plan. So I just want to recognize um, six of them that are in the room right now. Um, and hopefully I, I have a poll, so hopefully I'm not missing anyone, but um, Peggy, Carol, Angelica, Colleen, Brian, and Heather um, were all part of this committee. We met for about five weeks to come up with a lot of the logistics and the work behind um, this plan. So um, we always, when we're looking at any program, one thing that we're looking at is trying and trying to expand it is making sure that we are aligning it to what's happening during the school day. So when we first got together, we re-looked at our expanded definition of student success, our LCAP goals, what some of our core values are. Um, we also reminded ourselves about our commitment to whole child, whole family, whole community, and how that is an approach that we are taking um, with everything that we're implementing from now. So we started doing guiding principles with the contingency plan. So when we were doing the contingency plan for the closure of schools, um, I, I developed the idea of having the gui these guiding principles. Um, the guiding principles actually are really helpful for us because when we have a disagreement on how we're going to implement something, then we wind up going back to these guiding principles and then these guiding principles really help us um, to know what the answer is to that question. And so I'm not going to read them all, but I will read the highlighted. So provide equity of access and equity of opportunity to ensure that we're engaging both academic and social emotional learning, that it's culturally specific and culturally responsive, um, that we have a commitment to youth voice and leadership, and that we're valuing and building on our staff, students, families, and community partner ecosystem assets and aspirations. Um, and so we did a lot of work on this to try to find out what people wanted and needed. So we, I do something called conversations with the superintendent and so every week I do a conversation with a different 
staff and then we do a collaborative activity so we had a total of 922 responses that you'll see here um, and this is just the the top respondent responses um, and you could see the top response was sports and extracurricular for this time and then you can go on down the reason why I highlight this is one it allowed for around um, 12 different staffs to have a lot of time on this topic um, but these responses here are actually how we came up with responses that you're going to see in a minute that were in the Google survey so we asked parents and students and we also asked staff these questions um, parents and, and staff we had 915 responses which is about common for us we're usually about a thousand we tried to be at about a thousand and you what you can see is we have about a third of our families that said that they wanted either before school or before and after school so that's going to be important to see in a minute um, why we why we're showing that when we look at staff results you see we asked them if they would be willing to support and you can see that we had a pretty good portion of our staff that said that they'd be willing to help um, one or both times and so that that's a that's a positive so then we have, if you look at the actual uh, app or proposal that is in on board docs, which we are going to have to submit to the state, we are we're required to to ask about specific content areas. So that is why the survey looks this way. So you may say, oh, it looks redundant, but it's different at the top. So if you read the top portion, that top portion is what changes. If you look at these options, if you're like, well, how do you come up with these options? That was from the conversations with the superintendent. So we didn't just make those up. We actually sorted what people said from conversations with the superintendent and that's how we came up with these. What you'll find is we had very much alignment and we did with our contingency planning too, which is actually a positive for us is we had a lot of alignment between what our parents and students wanted and what our what our staff wanted. So when we look at parents and students when it comes to active and engaged learning, they wanted STEAM activities and math tutoring and homework support as their top three areas. When we look at staff, we see fairly similar. We see a little bit of shift. Um, so STEAM is still number one. Um, they instead wanted career technical education as a focus um, but you can see homework support and math tutoring was still very high um, for those areas when we we're looking at skill building um, athletic programs and VAPA was um, the top two responses for parents and students and you can see that was mirrored in staff as well staff wanted those same things um, when we're looking at how can we engage in youth voice and leadership you'll see that field trips was by far the number one educational field trips and that's what our staff said as well so we're going to show you how we're going to integrate this feedback into our plan in a couple of minutes um, when we talk about cultural and linguistic diversity social emotional learning access and equity you'll see again educational field trips was by far number one um, by followed by live music um, when you look at our staff, they, they again had educational field trips that, as one. There's a little bit of variance here in that they then focused on mental health support and the needs for our students to receive that. Um, and then when we're looking at collaborative partners, we asked them what type of partners would you like us to partner with? Um, they, for parents, they focused on life skills, financial planning, and gardening, and then YMC as the top three um, for staff um, life lab and gardening was number one again life skills was two and YMCA was um, was in this case four um, teen kitchen came out a little bit higher for staff um, but you can still see a lot of similarities there so 
we um, we are going to do a rollout plan. Um, so just so that to provide, provide the board a little bit of context, these this money that's coming down is really really targeting or meant for school districts that don't have a robust after school program like we have. So we have a lot. We have a very robust um, extended learning program that Carol Ortiz has been leading for many years. Most school districts don't have as robust of a program as us. Um, so we're fortunate because we're going to be able to build off of the infrastructure that is already in place. So we are going, we are not required to do a morning program, but we are going to provide the morning program because of the data that I showed you earlier. Um, but we are going to do it in a phased in approach. So this first, this first phase, um, what you'll see is anything in bold is required by the grant. Anything that is italics is new to try to kind of orient you. So we are going to provide after school hours. The change why it's, why it's italics is because currently we do not provide any support to TK kinder and first grade students for the most part during the school day that is. Um, and then we are going to be providing that. We're also going to be providing a before school program for PM, TK and kinder students which I'll go into specifics in a little bit. We will continue our regular offerings for grades 7 through 12. So we do have some current offerings for students 7 through 12. This grant is specifically for TK through 6th grade students. Um, phase 2 will continue, but you'll see, which is italics but not bold because we're not required to do it, we will basically after winter break, we're going to start the before school program for all, at all of our elementary sites. Um, we also believe in iterating, so we will start the evaluation process as well with our families to say what's going well, what isn't, and start making changes and pivots to that. The rest underneath is all the same, um, so I won't review it. Phase three is where it's going to be basically the following school year, not this upcoming in two, in two months, but the following. We will evaluate whether or not we fiscally can provide expansion of the 7th through 12th because this grant is not meant for those grades and so we're required to spend the money first on our TK through 6th grade. So it all is about how many parents really want it. So if, if we have a large amount of parents that want it, it's possible that we will spend all that, all that money yearly on the TK through sixth grade program. Um, and then we'll be serving and moving, moving that through. Um, this is our major change. So our major change is what are we going to do for our TK and kinder families? So we have three different situations because of three different types of schools. So we have some schools that have both AM and PM kinder, and that is those five schools that you see there. So High Landmark, Mar Vista, Radcliffe, and Starlight. Then you have some school sites, it's seven of them, and you can see the listing, that have already transitioned to all AM kinder. They have no PM kinder. And then you have six that are in the pilot that Casey was talking about that already are doing full day kinder. So we have to have three different ways of supporting families. So for PM Kinder, we are we are going to be working with our community organizations. CKC is already in some of our north zones. YMCA and Parks and Rec have already expressed interest in wanting to provide support to basically possible as a max 180 students. Um, because it's nine classes, which is about 180 students. What they would do is they would provide the before school programming. The reason why we're thinking about this is because it would provide ultimate flexibility to a family. If they were to drop off their student at an elementary site, they would have to do it at a particular time just because of f traffic flows and all that supervision. We couldn't have them randomly dropping students off. So we would have to say, you have to drop off your child every day at 8 a.m. or whatever time was selected. 
with this model, we would act, they'd actually be given a window and be told anytime between 8 to 11, you can drop your child off at YMCA or Parks and Rec. We will we'll sign them, right? It won't be either or because of transportation. So it may be Hyde and Landmark, you're going to go to YMCA, um, Radcliffe and Starlight, you're going to go to Parks and Rec, right? Or it may be just one. Um, but what it would allow is if you have have a parent who is off that day, they could take their child at 10 o'clock and say, I'm going to drop him, drop her, him off at 10. Or if they have something that they need to do, they can do 8 o'clock. There's some flex there. For AM kinder, what would happen is they'd go to school and then we would hire or extend instructional assistants to basically do the time between when they get out of school and extended learning starts. So I didn't put the times because it varies, So, but a Approximately, it's about 11.30 to 2 is when they would be with instructional assistants. They would be provided um, program opportunities during that time, and then they would go to the after-school program after that. For our full day K sites, they would just simply follow the first through fifth, sixth grade schedule um, that was mentioned. Um, and so this is an example of how it currently looks in the after school program for right now. So right now we have students that are in kindergarten that are in our summer program that are doing a 7 through 30 to 430 program. And you, so you can see it's a combination of multiple activities that are developmentally appropriate for our, our TK and kinder students um, and are engaging um, at the same time and also utilize um, some of our partners. This is a sample first through fifth grade program option. This is currently um, what it looks like in our after school program that we are extending to 6, 6 um, p.m. And so you can see um, how there has to be two elements. So part of this program, we're required to do two elements. We must do an academic support element and we must do an enrichment element. And so you can see both of those elements are within this um, schedule. And this would be similar to what would happen at every single elementary school. Going back to the guiding principle of equity of access and equity of opportunity. This is what a middle school, so we aren't going to be focusing as much on the seventh and eighth graders because it's not required, but we are focusing on all the sixth graders. And so you can see this is what would be provided um, to all of our sixth graders that wish to um, be part of the programming. And again, starting um, as soon as school gets out and providing them support up to, um, up to six o'clock. So another element of this program is we have to provide an additional 30 days of non-instructional days. So just like we are now, we're offering nine hours. We will continue to offer the grand majority of those days during summer school. And we will offer a short portion of them during winter intercession. We, d we chose Saturdays because this will allow us to feed off of the request for the field trips. So during this, what will happen is during these times, we will tell the parents where these locations are. Um, they will be able to drop their children off at various locations throughout um, the community. It could be community partners, it could be our sites, it, it could be a combination. And um, some of those students, so it wouldn't be every child, but we would say, so I'm making this up, this is an example, September 24th, we would have all of our fourth graders going to Monterey Bay Aquarium, right? Or we would have on October 22nd, everybody going to a field trip to UCSC, right? And so this would allow us to be able to do that and we will make sure and provide those locations prior to the first day. So you probably, especially as board members, you're gonna, people are gonna ask you, oh, how do I get a hold of this program? And so um, registration for current second through sixth grade students that have an after school program, that already occurred in spring. 
So that already occurred if they have extended learning program at their site, which is most of our sites except for in the North Zone. Um, and that was a paper application. We're actually going to be having live registration for our TK through first grade students who never have not had the opportunity to register and also any additional second through sixth grade students um, starting July 1st. And that's this Friday, so or next Friday. It's online, and it will be both online and paper applications. Um, that registration will close July 20th. You may say, well, why do you have to do that? If we are going to provide transportation, which is a priority um, so that there's equity of access, um, we have to know who needs that transportation, and we have to know their address to create a bus stop. Um, we also know that families need support. Um, and so we families will be able to do it online. If they have challenges, they will be able to go to our wellness center daily um, for support or Tuesday through Saturday. We also will have additional support on those two days noted and also have Meseco Bajo support on those two days. So if a parent needs support, um, they can do that. We also are going to have staff at the summer school sites, um, which is basically throughout the district. Um, from July 11th to the 15th so that if parents need that additional support they can do that. There is continuous enrollment when it comes to expanded learning opportunities program but it's until filled. So basically that means that it is 50% um, is our target. 50% uh, of all students grades TK through 6th grade. Mm -hmm. So it will be about um, 4,000 students. So if I am a school of 400, my target will be 200 students will be in this program. Um, and the first day of the program will be as it has been in the past, which is the first day of school. It will start. Um, and so that is our goal. And so I will open it up for questions from you. Are there any speakers to this item? One second. None. Okay. Any discussion or questions from the board? Trustee Dodge. I think it's a great idea for field trips on Saturdays. You know, I think it gives parents an opportunity. You know, oh well, there's not enough field trips. Well, here you go. Now it's up. You know, you, the district is providing the field trips. Now it's up to you to complete that I have, so I think that's a great idea. Thank you very much. No other questions? Oh, Jen Holt. Um, I just wanted to say that I'm I'm in full support of this. It's like you know when you know, knowing how much need there was when my kids were were younger and how much of a difference that would have made to our our family. I, I can only imagine. How, how much of a difference it would make to other families in our district. Um, and so this is exciting. And I just want to, you know, thank everybody who has put work in on this. It's, um, it's going to be a big help. Um, so in the past with certain programs, we've had um, some trouble criminally with people that potentially aren't properly vetted. So to the extent that we're gonna have tremendous amounts of kids and using some outside vendors to provide the care, what will be the safeguards? So, I mean, it is about 180 students if every student went forward. Um, we currently use YMCA and have used YMCA and Parks and Rec um, for many years. I think it's exp it's specifically expanded, especially with COVID, um, because we did childcare through that. And then this year, actually, YMCA helps support us when we we were down staff. So we were actually down staff for the after for the summer school program and so they came through um, I mean I feel like we we have a they have a pretty stringent process on who they employ and the way that they employ um, so I feel pretty confident that because they're they're very solidified partners we won't have a challenge everybody else will be our own staff so um, 
it will really just be the the PMTK students and, and kinder students that will be more with YMCA and Parks and Rec. But um, but I hear you, and we'll make sure that it's um, it's really clean. Yeah, I, I would. Yeah, I just we need two adults together. You know, we, I don't want just one adult. Well, it's a 10 to 1 ratio, so they'll have a lot of adults. That's great. Excellent. Okay. <laughs> um, okay. Any other questions or discussion? This is just great. one clarification. Yeah. Um, so as far as how parents can apply, would these be available directly on the district side or individual schools? So we are going to release it very similar to how they released it for this summer. So there will be a QR code, and we're going to directly send that link um, to parents via Remind. So the, it will wind up on the first, it will wind up being on their phone with the link and they can just tap it. And if they, if they want paper, then they can go to any of these locations that we noted. They can also go to the extended learning, oper um, the extended learning um, department, but um, these are extra areas that are centralized for them. Great, thank you. Yeah. Okay. I would like to make a motion to approve this item. Thank I'll you. I'll second. First and second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Abstaining? Motion carries. Thank you. Okay. Um, item 9.7, approval of the Edu Climber data management system. That was a yes, and if you didn't hear me. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jay. Good evening, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. I'm here this evening um, to uh, show you EduClimber data systems, the whole child data management system, and ask for your approval for the uh, purchase for the contract. So um, EduClimber, what it is, is earlier you heard um, Mr. Clappenbach talking about all the different data that we need for all the different grants. EduClimber brings all that data into one platform and provides visualizations so we understand and get a whole picture of our students, and it really helps us to build out our MTSS framework. And it's why EduClimber. In our current system, what we have to do is we pull data from multiple systems, whether it's our, um, our SIS, um, Illuminate, um, MAP, the NWA growth, and other systems, and we look at them separately. EduClimber pulls in the data all into one, puts it in one place, so we are able to have a whole picture of the students that are in our schools. There's um, multiple different platforms that we can use to look at that there. So there are different data charts and items for school and district admin, for school psychologists who are looking at if a child was referred for um, testing for special education, they have the opportunity to look at the different interventions that have been tried and the student as a whole child in one platform. Uh, our intervention teachers, can use it to look at for each of their ch the students that they are working at, look at the strengths and weaknesses of each individual child, decide on what interventions or what uh, programs that they're gonna be using with this child and monitor how it is working. For um, classroom teachers, it also provides a data snapshot of the students that are in their classroom. And then the student profile, um, really it gives the ability for us to look at the student and um, dig deeper to figure out the root cause analysis of what the student needs, whether it's behavior, social, emotional learning, or whether it's in reading whether or, or math. And so it gives that ability to bring in all the data so that we can really understand and um, provide the resources needed for all of our individual students. Uh, we, there are different data walls and then charts, so it takes all the data and the information and it provides a visualization so that we can understand and look at trends over time. We can look at whether it's student trends, classroom trends, um, school trends, or even um, looking at data analysis of the different programs, instructional programs, or the social emotional programs that we have in place to determine whether these programs are indeed working. The intervention model modules, what this does is it allows when students are referred and need extra support, it allows us to program, um, 
to monitor uh, the effectiveness of the interventions that we have in place. Right now, we are working with students. We look at it, we keep our, the information in a notebook or something else, pull data. This goes through and it allows us to look at the entire cycle of the interventions that were put in place and determine whether this is working for the individual child. It also follows the student, so as a student goes from grade to grade, the teacher can look back at what interventions have done in the past, did it work, so that they don't repeat what has been done and did not work for uh, students. The last thing that it provides um, are thresholds, where we set we, oh, it's connecting to Zoom again. We, we, we set um, different thresholds, and so it's an early warning system. So as students, if they pass a certain threshold, then the students pop up and say this student is in, is it past the threshold, it's an, a warning system, whether it's because of behaviors, social emotional learning, or academics, to, so it brings that student to the surface for us, so we can look at what we need to do to support the student. And with that, staff asked for our approval. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to make one note. So you have, over this year, you've heard me talk about KPIs, Key Performance Indicators. Um, the dashboard currently is using EduClimber, but it's an internal only dashboard. This, with this purchase, it would allow us to make um, an external dashboard, which we would be able to then show our pub show the public um, in a consistent basis, um, multiple of our measures, um, which I think our public has asked for on transparency on data. So I just wanted to add this um, for um, regarding the KPIs. Thank you. And with that, staff asked for the approval of the three-year contract for EduClimber. We and do have one speaker. Okay, great. Brandon Denise. Greetings again, I'm still hanging in here. Um, I wanna speak on this item because I feel like it would just be a complete waste. Like it looks beneficial in a fantasy land, but we don't live in a fantasy land. We live in a reality where teachers already have so much data coming at us from so many different angles and directions, but we don't have the time to interpret the data. We don't have the time to figure out how do we utilize this data effectively. So without this time, this is just throwing money at something that's not going to be utilized by your teachers. Why don't we have that time? Because we have unfilled positions, we're constantly stubbing on our prep, and the same story that's been told. But I would also like to point out that last year was my first year teaching SDC mild moderate math, and I taught that without any other curriculum other than what the general education students use, and I had access to Map Accelerator. So there was no math program to help lift those students up to access those. I was on Teachers Pay Teachers looking for stuff. I was uh, adapting and accommodating big ideas. But when we have teachers that don't have a curriculum and don't have the time, we can't even put the data and notes into synergy for when a student is having um, behaviors or we need to let the other staff know because we hardly have time to breathe. So this money is just going to go down a hole that is not going to be benefit your teachers. Hopefully it benefits those higher up than the teachers. But from my perspective as a special education teacher, this is really irrelevant to me and seems like a waste. So thank you. Thank you. Any comments, questions, discussion? I have a question for you. Um, would, as a parent, would parents be able to access their student profile, their student data? They would access it through the school. They, they wouldn't have direct access where they could log on and see their student profile, but they could get it from the school site. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Yeah, Jen Holm. Um, so this looks a lot like, you know, kind of the consolidation work that, you know, like similar to what we see with medical charts and, and all that. Can you tell me a little bit about how student data is protected? Yes, so with all of it, there are laws and regulations in terms of data, data um, with our students. So within when we reach, when we go in with the agreements with any um, corporation that has the data, there are um, signed agreements that take place where the, the information on students, whether it's their ID or their birth date, is not allowed um, to exit the system and go into the external world um, where it is, it is kept internal and in-house because of the privacy laws that do protect students. 
And is, did that answer your question? Yeah. yeah. Um, so who's the end user of this data information? So there are there can be multiple end users, and so within this platform, the biggest piece is yes, it is. It takes a lot of the different data points that we have with our students throughout the day, <laughs> academic, social, emotional, and um, behavioral, and puts it in one place. So it's an, a snapshot of the student, or you can drill down and go more deep. Depending on the interface that you're using, um, it can be district school admin, it can be school psychologists when they are going before they go in to evaluate a student or determine whether a student needs an evaluation. It can be used by the intervention teachers who are working with um, 90 plus students or how many students that they're working in small groups with different teachers. It could also be used with the classroom teacher. Um, and I believe I skipped one, but I think that's... Wellness teams. And the wellness teams. It can be used wellness teams as well. So it takes data mm -hmm. from multiple um, testing platforms that we currently have yes right. and yes but it's hard to really know what's going on with a kid unless like a psychologist gives them an assessment right strengths and weaknesses when when you're looking at that 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 when you when you're thinking in that terms that's for a specific reason why a psychologist does that uh -huh. when you have the data in front of you you could look at it um, and look to determine within um, reading what is taking place where the student is is has a deficit okay or so then couldn't the, it be ineffective teaching also I mean does it pick up that maybe the classroom teacher is not the greatest or it also that happens too. Right? Yeah. So if, what it would do is if you have a whole entire classroom where students are not succeeding in a specific, let's just say a specific math area, that possible then it is in in the within the teaching of that math concept or that might be okay. ability. So there are different ways that the data can be used depending on the interface that you're using and the information you're seeking. The benefit to it is that all the data is pulled and then you can drill down to say I, I'm curious about this or as an intervention teacher I've been doing small groups we've been working on reading fluency. I want to see if for Clint that his reading fluency has indeed increased over the last three weeks and that will be able to tell me if the other students within the group did see their increase based on the work that I'm directly doing but Clint did not Clint might need a different intervention so I shouldn't continue that intervention for Clint if all the students within my group are not increasing then possibility possible it is my teaching that I'm doing and then I may have to go back and reflect and look and try something different okay mm -hmm. I was just going to say, I think as a former principal where I could see this would be the best would be what we call student study teams so, or, or our wellness teams, right? So we have a list of students that we're concerned about. We currently have to hunt and peck a whole bunch of different locations in order to get all this information. This would allow us to consolidate it into one location. Um, me personally, what I am the most excited about is our KPIs because we're using it as, at the district level to track how things are going. And I always have parents that are saying, well, how's the district doing? And I think it would be fantastic to have the eight areas that we find the most important. Anyone can look at it a moment's notice and see, and it changes as we input new scores. So it's not static, it's, um, it's continually um, evolving. Um, and I think with every system, there's a rollout to it, right? And so for every system, you know, we generally start out at district with district site admin, and then we move it to wellness, and then we move it to SSTs, right? And we move it through. And then we have some teachers that want to take it on before that, and some that don't. Um, but we do need a system that allows us to continue to look at data from multiple vantage points. So. And then are there any uh, negative unintended consequences to using a platform like this? The only negative unintended consequence I see is that it's not used enough. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions, discussion? Would anyone like to make a motion to approve this? Sure, I'll make a motion. <laughs> I'll second. 
Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, moving on to 9.8, a memorandum of understanding between PVFT and PVUSD for federally funded MSHS split shifts. Yes. Good evening, President Deserpa, Board of Trustees, Dr. Rodriguez. This is a renewal of a MOU you saw in August of this school year. Um, the MOU is between us and PVFT, and it's to identify a per diem amount for for members in the Migrant Seasonal Head Start program for working additional hours, which will help minimize the need for split shifts. Um, also, language that we agreed upon was to outline how the hiring process and practices were gonna work within the department for the split shifts, as well as notification for the assignments ahead of time. Um, and so, something new to it, except for we are extending the years, so I request that you please um, approve the MOU as presented. <coughs> We have no speakers. Thank you. Any questions or discussion? Okay, looking for a motion. We move to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Mm -hmm. Item 9.9, .9, Memorandum of Understanding between PVFT and PVUSD for the Buena Vista Children's Center split shifts. Yes, again, thank you, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. This again is a renewal MOU that we presented in August. Um, this again outlines the per diem amount for additional, up to additional hours for Buena Vista Children's Center um, employees in order to minimize split shifts. Um, and then it outlines the hiring practices that have already been in place for that MOU. So again, the only difference is we're extending the MOU um, out a few years. So I request again that you approve this MOU. Any speakers? None. Okay, any discussion or questions? I'll move to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries, thank you. Mm -hmm. Is it you again, Allison? It is. Okay. It's actually Pam, but she got to go to Europe, so okay. uh, it's, you get me. <laughs> uh, item 9.10, re revised classification description, uh, impact and resource development officer. Yes. So classified employees um, can go through a process if there are, the classified employees themselves or the district when needs of the district change. And what I mean by that is if we have, if we have positions in, in those classifications that work has shifted um, for a numerous amount of reasons, there's a process where they can submit a request to have their position re-looked at and possibly reclassified. And uh, some of the basic criteria, they need to be submitted between January and March. Um, and if there's gonna be any changes or additional duties added to the classification, the employee needs to have been doing those duties for at least two years. So it's not stuff that just kind of comes on and off people's plates. It's something where, like I said, it's a district-wide change. So that process, it goes to Pam. She reviews the classification. She, she studies the job, the duties, um, may revise a title, may revise a job description. And in some instances, depending on what the work is, there can be a salary change. So the process then is once that's reviewed, it goes to the Personnel Commission for um, recommendation and approval. And the next step is that it comes to all of you for final approval. So this is Andrea Willie's uh, position. So she was the district grant writer, or currently is the district grant writer. And the recommendation is for it to go to an impact and resource development officer. Um, as you can imagine, she's a very ambitious employee and has taken on some, some work and really shifted and morphed the position. Um, so that is the recommendation there uh, outlined in red are the additions that would, or changes to the job description. And then, um, she would be moving from like a 215 um, employee to a 12 month employee. So that's also what's included on as the salary schedule. So I request that you please approve this um, classification change. Are there any speakers to this item? None. Okay, any um, questions? Jen Holm? Just as a reminder for the mm -hmm. general public and for the board, in, in terms of you know, we're talking about like salary changes, but what, how much has, like the grants and things that she's written, how much has that brought into our district? 13 million in four years. Okay. There you go. And just to, I understand what you're asking, just to, to highlight too, it's also, she's gonna be working additional days, so it's 
So even though the salary is going up a little bit, it's days work. So we're getting more days out of her as well. I make a motion to approve. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Okay, next is item 9.11, resolution 22-2302 regarding the education protection account. Good evening, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees, and Dr. Rodriguez. I'm here to present to you Resolution 22-2302. This is something we do annually per Ed Code, where we need to actually have the board approve a resolution that states that we are accepting the Education Protection Account funds and that we will be uh, what we will be using them for. As we have done in the prior years and every year, we uh, we use these funds to actually pay for certificated teachers' salaries and benefits. Um, unfortunately, while it sounds like the education protection account would mean more revenue for the district. It actually is just offset by LCFF. So the more we get in EPA, the less we get in LCFF. So really it's uh, washed and it's all been already presented in the budget. So this time I'd ask the board to approve this resolution. Are there any speakers to this item? None. Any comments or questions from the board? I'll move to approve. Okay, I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Motion carries. Thank you, Clint. Thank you. Okay, and we already covered 9.12 and 9.13. So next up, we have our consent agenda. And I'd like to, before we approve our consent agenda, I'd like to acknowledge a donation for our Merrill Lagasse Culinary Garden and Teaching Kitchen from our friends uh, Karen and Clint Miller, a $10,000 donation. Thank you so much. Um, we do have two speakers oh, in two okay. different items, so uh -huh. we're going to have to pull item 10.6 and item 10.7. So I'll make a motion mm -hmm. to approve the consent agenda pulling those two items. 10.6 and 10.7? Yes. Okay. Um, I'd like to continue before we talk more. Um, also acknowledging a donation from for the culinary kitchen from Kurt and Carolyn Coleman. Thank you very, very much. Okay, we have a motion. Would anyone like to second? I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 So we have now item 10.6. Heather. So this is this is 2223 contracts for non-public agencies NPAs for special services under SELPA. Good evening, President DeSerpa, Board of Trustees. Should I speak now for this? Okay. Okay. So um, this first one is the non-public staff agency agreement. So these are the agencies we've worked with with. The, um, past several years now and we only go to agencies when we are um, at that point where we can't find staff to fill our positions where we've already worked with HR extensively to fill positions and so they actually have been very helpful in the past in filling up filling our positions where we would have had vacancies if we didn't have um, somebody from an agency to support. Uh, Brandon Denise. Um, so I just wanted to speak out when I was previewing the agenda. The word contract is used for the title of this agenda, but I believe contracts usually come with a cost or something more than just a list. So for me, I'm asking where's the cost, where's the accountability, and where's the oversight? Um, to me, it unfortunately seems like this district's reliance on agency personnel isn't just that last gasp 
break in case of emergency, but it seems like a primary strategy. Um, students benefit most by having highly trained and capable credentialed teachers and service personnel um, who actually live in the area that they work. And for many teachers in this district, we can't afford to live in this area that we work, and we lose out on many teachers every summer. Um, when we're in negotiations, this um, district fights really hard um, against the PBFT, which you should, um, but when it comes to use agencies, it just seems like we give them a blank check when they're just a Band-Aid type of solution. Um, I'm curious what a Public Record Act request would reveal if we were to look at the numbers of agency personnel hired for SLPs, RSPs, psychologists, and nurses over the last five years. Um, that's actually a genuine question that I have. Um, and I did fill out a speaker card for 10.7, but I kind of got them too mixed. So if it's okay with the board, I won't speak on 10.7 and instead use this time to wish everybody a good night's sleep, um, happy summer. Hopefully you get some time with your families to enjoy the beach because this is a really beautiful area to live and we do appreciate this. So thank you so much and have a good night. Thank you. Any other speakers to that item? None. Okay. <clears throat> and any questions or comments from the board? So, Heather, I do have one question. So I know, like, um, you know, I work for a hospital, and I know that we have to have a master contract mm -hmm. with multiple agencies that we may or may not be using currently, but it ha but every year they come up for re-renewal just in case we need to use them. Is that what I'm looking at here? Yes. So we do have a master contract that we um, get from the state, and we look at using that. And then right. if we do go with one of the agencies, then we do an individualized contract for each person. Okay, great. Um, I'll make a motion to approve this master list. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Anyone opposed, by the way? Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. And do do we so do we have a speaker on 10.7 then? I guess uh, we not it. anymore. Okay. So you, we you just pulled. So I'll make a motion to approve 10.7. Okay. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And t by the way, ten just for the public's record, 10.7 is the 2022-23 master contract for non-public schools and a list of NPS for special services department. And that passed, sounds like unanimously, thank you. Okay. Okay, next we're, we have um, item 13.1, action and report on closed session. All right, this one's a little lengthy tonight. Okay, under item, closed session item 2.1, I move to approve the certificated personnel report as presented by the district administration on June 22nd, 2022, with 21 and 15 additional action items. I'll second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone opposed or abstaining? Thank you. Under closed session item 2.2, .2, I move to approve the classified personnel report as presented by the district administration on June 22nd, 2022 with eight and five additional action items. I'll second. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone opposed? Okay, thank you. Sorry. There's one okay. You're, oh, I'm so sorry. So we have um, sick. Is Jen Schaffer no, even? She, so? she logged off. It's 511. Okay, 511. Okay. Under closed session item 2.3, the board approved a settlement agreement for classify employee 6726 with a zero, with a 70 vote. And we do have a couple of announcements. Announcement number one, the Parra Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Selena Munoz Casas as a new principal of Rolling Hills Middle School. Ms. Munoz began her career in PVUSD as a behavior technician in the special education program. She moved into teaching special education in 2009 and taught in those programs till 2017. She has served as an assistant principal at both PV High School and Rolling Hills Middle School since 2017. She earned a bachelor's degree from UCS in history and her ed specialist uh, credential from CSUMB. She's currently working on her doctorate at San Jose State. 
PVOZ is excited to welcome this highly accomplished educator to her new role. Announcement number two, the Pearl Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Dagoberto Garcia as a new principal of EA Hall Middle School. Mr. Garcia has been working with students since 1997 as a kindergarten teacher and a fifth grade teacher. Additionally, he has been a special education teacher at both middle and elementary schools. Mr. Garcia has been an assistant principal, dean of students, and a superintendent. Mr. Garcia obtained a bachelor's degree from UC CSE and his teaching and admin credentials from Chapman University. He also earned a doctorate from University of the Pacific. His dissertation was on English language learner parental involvement. He is excited to join PBUSD as a principal of Vive Hall and his years of experience will serve him well. Announcement number three. The Powell Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Heather Bailey as the new principal of Radcliffe Elementary. Ms. Bailey began working with students in 2006 as a second and third grade teacher. In 2013, she became the after school coordinator and assistant principal for Freedom Elementary, and in 2018, moved to the position of academic coordinator at Radcliffe elementary. She holds a master's degree in educational leadership from uh, San Jose State University and a bachelor's degree from Bloomsburg University of Pennsylvania in elementary education. PUSD is excited to welcome this highly accomplished educator to her new role. Announcement number four. The Pearl Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Terrence Redfern as a new director of mathematics for PVUSD. Mr. Redfern holds a bachelor's and a master's degree in mathematics from CSU Fullerton and UCSC respectively. He has been in education from 2009 working with students in a variety of roles. He has begun he has been an assistant principal and most recently the principal of San Lorenzo Valley Middle School. Mr. Redfern brings a wealth of math experience to his new position and PVUSD is excited for him to join our administrative team. Announcement number five. The Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Juan Alcantar as the new principal of Pajaro Middle School. Mr. Alcantar had been the assistant principal of Lakeview Middle School for the last seven years. Before that, he worked as an elementary school teacher at Alianza and was a migrant support teacher for PBUSD Migrant Education Program. He holds a bachelor's degree in social sciences from CSU Sacramento and a master's in educational leadership from San Jose State University. We're excited for Mr. Alcantar to join the staff at Paro Middle School in his new role. Announcement number six. The Paro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Allison Hanks Sloan as a new principal of Aptos High School. Mrs. Hanks Sloan began her educational career in 1995, where she taught English in Ethiopia with the Peace Corps. She has wor also worked as a coordinator of English language learners, as a director of Teach and AmeriCorps, and most recently as the founding principal of the International High School at Largo in Maryland. She holds a doctorate degree in teaching and learning from University of Maryland, a master's of education ESL from the Georgetown George Washington University and a Bachelor's of Arts in Cultural Anthropology from University of New Mexico and San Diego State. We're excited to welcome this highly accomplished educator to her new position. And lastly, announcement number seven. The Pajaro Valley Unified School District is pleased to announce the selection of Carrie Lee Rooks as the new principal of Aptos Junior High School. Mrs. LaRox began her career in 1994 in Cape Town, South Africa, and has been a teacher, a middle school assistant principal, a principal at an elementary school, and was recently the program director of special service in PVUSD. She holds a master's degree in administration and supervision from San Jose State University, and a bachelor's degree of education from the University of Cape Town, and a bachelor's of arts from Rhodes University in Grahamstown, South Africa. We are excited to welcome Mrs. LaRox to her new role. And that's all we have. Thank you. Uh, item 14.1, our upcoming meeting will be held on July 27th, 2022. And with that, we are now adjourned. Thank you.